of the Owl Triangle, and we have another hot episode coming to you guys today. Welcome back. We're glad to have you here. Episode 19. Today we are joined by Joe McColgan and James Sheen, a jam-packed show. We're going to be talking about Cage Conflict 8 and a bunch of other Irish news uh, that has been happening since we've last been on. Lads, thanks for joining me again today. It's great to be here again to talk all things Irish MMA. As always, I'm joined by Andy Stevenson and Quil Shadabara. How are you today, lads? I hope you're keeping well. I'm absolutely buzzing, lads. What is the crack? It has been a wild few weeks in Irish MMA, so it That's is great to be back here Andy. chatting with you. It is, it's great to be back here chatting with you, lads. It absolutely is, and we have plenty to discuss, and we won't hang around yeah. anymore. We'll get straight into it, and we're going to talk Gage Conflict 8 right from the get-go here. And, you know, generally we talk about a lot of things about involving a lot of other people, Andy. I'm going to open up today just to talk about, you know, uh, an incident that happened that kind of circled around you um, from Cage Conflict 8, and that was the fallout of uh, John Redmond's fight, who was supposed to be taking on Kyle McClurkin. Um, you know, John wasn't medically cleared to fight. Uh, the fight was pulled, and there was a video that he put up on his Instagram, Andy, that was directed at you about the incident Um, And I just want to give you the time maybe to just kind of give your side of the story and and, and kind of talk about what happened with that and everything else. Yeah, look, I I had a feeling we'd uh, we'd chat about it today. And and look, it's it's something that that we should chat about and and that we we have chatted about before. And not, you know, not just this, but look, we're here to cover all aspects of Irish MMA. And I suppose... um, that also means that um, what I quickly found out the last week is that sometimes the opinions we have have uh, have real world consequences, um, as we found out the other day. So look, ultimately what happened was, uh, you know, we saw that that John uh, fought a number of weeks ago, at Cage Legacy Seventeen, where he was TKO'd. Um, now I put my opinion out there after that, after he had been rebooked um, for Cage Conflict. So. You know, once so, a, a lot of this kind of stems around a grey area in Irish MMA and in safety and and in everything right now. Where uh, off the back of that show, John was medically suspended by the safe MMA doctors on site. Um, so that night, a, a doctor would have assessed him at like any other fighter. There was another fighter, I think, um, Niall Tucker, who was on the card, and this is all. You know, I'm not disclosing anyone's information. Here. This is all publicly available. There's a there's a register that Safe MMA maintain. Um. And so they're medically suspended till the 14th of November, I believe. Um, now, aside from that, I put out an opinion on Twitter where I had seen, I, I you know, I had seen that, that John had fought a couple of weeks ago. I'd seen how the fight went. I obviously gave my opinion on how that fight went. And look, it was, it could be deemed as harsh. Um, you can disagree with it, that's grand, but it was just my opinion. Um, and I was kind of expressing a concern around fighter safety uh specifically john's where he's been put in a cage again two weeks later and i just didn't agree with it um and it's nothing against john uh whatsoever if anything i would you know from my perspective i thought i was doing the the right thing by trying to to look out for a fighter um but ultimately he he was not happy with the whole situation obviously the fight ended up getting cancelled um i know that the the post on Twitter was kind of taken over to Instagram and then it kind of just escalated from there. I didn't, I never thought that this was going to, while I, while I stand by, you know, I, I wish I had kind of worded the, the tweet a bit differently, but it was still my opinion at the end of the day. Um, but I was concerned and I stand by that concern for fighter safety. Um, and it's nothing to do with John. It's not, it, it, it doesn't matter who it was. There was another fighter, um, on the card that I, it was kind of alerted to me after the fact that I didn't, I wasn't familiar with them beforehand, but then, you know, someone raised it to me and said that this guy had also fought a couple of weeks ago. And I said, yeah, you know, the exact same thing applies to them. Um, but yeah, so it was, uh, it, it got a bit, uh, it, it just kind of took some legs and, and the fight got canceled. And I felt terrible to be honest with you. Like in, I, I, while I, I, I stand behind my concern for fighter safety, I don't want to be in a position where, um, fighters are, are not able to fight, especially like, when I found out that it was cancelled, my first thought actually went to Kyle McClurkin, um, because I know he's a guy who's been training for, you know, he's been out for what, two years or something. Um, I was very excited to see him in there competing. Um, 
and he's not able to compete. I don't want to, like I uh, the same for John. I know John has as a family and maybe he's getting a few bob for that fight. I don't want to be, you know, um, I don't want someone to miss out on a payday. But at the end of the day, well, at the end of the day, it, it actually it wasn't my decision to call off the fight. At the end of the day, um, someone made a decision and it was the right decision in my in my mind. That's just my opinion, um, from a safety perspective. Where if you have a doctor in Ireland who has said that this a fighter should be suspended till the following month and then they're fighting two weeks later they can just go up the road like that more than anything to me it just highlights a, a gap in in safety standards in Ireland and this is going to continue to be the case so long as the sport is not recognised uh, officially under Sport Ireland or they're, they're like while I'm uh, in conjunction with Safe MMA are trying to put in safety protocols if they're not um, if they're not applicable to the entire country then there's there's a flaw there um and i'm not saying that's with i'm i say for me i'm saying that it's there's no there's no true governance there's no true governing body in this country um but yeah look um probably gone around in circles here but it was a it was a mad it was a mad day um and look i can completely understand why someone would be angry when they wanted to fight but i just put out an opinion and 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 i think that, you hit the yeah. nail on the head there the decision came from the medical staff at cage conflict that he 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 was not medically clear to fight. The video suggested that that was off your tweet, Andy, which I thought was unfair on you for just highlighting something that was going on, doing your job basically. Um, and ultimately, guys, fighter safety should be paramount because if we are dealt with another incident like we were dealt with an Irish MMA in two thousand and sixteen, and we have another unfortunate inc- incident similar. Are exactly the same as what Joe Carvalho sadly suffered back then. It is detrimental to the sport in this country. And, you know, everybody should be on the same wavelength when it comes to fighter safety. And ultimately, the right decision was made not to put John in there. And, and, and it has to be said. So credit to the medical team and credit to Cage Conflict for, for doing the right thing and, and pulling the fight. Now, what came after it is 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 off opinion of, of, of different people. I don't think it was right. Some of the uh, the messages that were directed towards you, Andy, uh, although I do understand it might, it's dis- difficult for fighters, you know, who are training to fight and don't get to fight, selling tickets and, and stuff like that. But we have to remember that safety has to be number one here and we cannot afford another debt or a serious injury. Like, it doesn't even have to be a death. It just could be another serious injury. And we'll talk about the Troy Gibson incident in a little bit later on. Um, you know, we don't want to start all negative. We'll talk a little bit about the card. We'll go to that as well. Fight, like, I think we're all in agreement and what everybody should be uh, thinking about here is fighter safety. And we cannot afford another slip up or another bad thing to happen inside of a cage in Irish MMA. 100%. 100%. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm glad I, I forgot to mention that that was one of the things I, I did want to bring up. At the end of the day, people in this, you know, MMA is not a real sport in the in the official sense in Ireland yet. And we've all seen, you know, people who've covered the, the, the scene prior to us, uh, people who've been involved in coaching, in, in fighting, have had to argue and claw and scrape to get some sort of respect on MMA in Ireland. Um, and it's the people who don't want to see MMA legalized, who don't want to see MMA existing in the country will use, but they'll look for anything to use as, as a stick to beat MMA with. So I personally think that overlooking fighter safety is a really bad or is a really dangerous um, and careless route to go down. Uh, Not only for one, most importantly, the fighter safety themselves. Um, And as you said, we'll talk about fighter safety in a, in a different sense in the same show um, about the Troy Gibson fight. Um, but also it's just it gives those people the credence to say well look at this sport they're like they don't care about their fighters they're just th- there's no regard for safety or for brain trauma or for any of these things um, and of course look of course MMA goes hand in hand with brain trauma and as does any combat sport but it's also a sport like it it doesn't mean that everything goes um, you have to try and make it as safe as possible while still acknowledging that that it is a part of the sport so um that that's my i feel very strongly about that and i don't ever ever want to see not not i don't i don't want to see let alone a death i don't want to see someone like like, mma is a dangerous sport look at look at what happened to ian cochlin and that's a a different situation but I, i want to avoid wherever possible uh 
those type of situations so where fighters are, are are prioritized as safety as possible within reason you know uh, yeah i don't know if that makes sense but yeah that's kind of it what is. i well, think look, about look, it look, look, we all know and we and you know we'll speak to joe mccalgan about you know the levels of uh understanding that fighters need to have when going in to compete in mixed martial arts it's dangerous enough as is but if we're not following safety protocols or we're not putting fighter safety first you're increasing the chances of something bad happening happening and ultimately if something bad again does happen in ireland where we have a serious injury or a death to another fighter that will set back the sport if you want to call it a sport if you don't want to call it a sport but that will set back mixed martial arts in ireland for for many years where it might not even recover again so hopefully you know lessons were learned and ultimately the right decision was made by the medical staff and by cage conflict to pull the fight and hopefully some similar decisions are made down the line if if they're posed upon any medical teams or any promotions out there as well and um you know it's a less learning curve for everybody and uh we'll move on and we'll talk a bit more about the card um because you know there are some great stories that came from the card as well and we'll start off with Jared Burns uh, taking home the flyweight championship. He took on uh, uh, Nouradeen Hazrat uh, in the main event. Like I said, for the vacant title, then it was a great performance by Jared. Uh, defended some takedowns early, uh, reverse positioned against the cage, landed some nice knees early on. A um, little bit of a scramble, ended up getting back to his feet and taken down. Uh, had his back taken briefly by, by uh, Hazrat, but got back to his feet again. Um, over and back, lots of scrambles in the grappling department here. Um, Jared found himself uh, locking in a guillotine choke on Hezra. Uh, Hezra tried to stand up to get out of it, couldn't muscle his way out of it, went back down to the mat, rolled it into the mounted guillotine and tapped almost immediately. Quilcha, very, very good performance here by Jared Burns first. Um, you know, uh, coming in here, f- fighting a tricky, tricky opponent but ultimately winning fairly handily in the end. I think he looked good, not to take anything away from him. I think like he was fantastic from start to finish. You know, it's a, it's a tough test against a guy with a lot more experience in the professional ranks. So, you know, Jared only turned pro this year. I think Hezrat's been fighting pro since what? I know he's not doesn't only fight since 2019. So like to come in against someone that little bit more experience and negate everything that they throw at you and, you know, don't even don't even get have any issues from them and don't you know Hezra didn't cause him any issues he it was re- yeah it was really impressive the fact that he was able to do that and then get in that get in that choke and finish the fight it was uh it topped off the night really well uh I think you know it was uh there was a lot of we are, I think we will have to speak about the rest of the night but to, for the main event it was a really good end to the night I must admit and uh, a fantastic performance from Jared Burns Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's important to talk about that, not to let anything else that happened on the night kind of take away from the fact that Jared put on a really good performance, picked up the flyweight title, only been training three years, Andy, you know, so he's, I mean, the world is his oyster. I mean, a lot of development to come from Jared Burns and, you know, it might set up a potential to fight down the line, a cage conflict as well. What's your thoughts on that fight overall? Yeah, just re- really impressive. I was there in his last fight on Cage Conflict against Robbie Brown, and and I was really impressed by him there because I like on the night I was saying, even back then I was like, this this could be you know you've got Jared Harris after winning the title that night, and we've got Jer- uh, Jared Burns here. This could be a nice you know next uh, fight. He obviously went away and he fought abroad in in a closely contested decision, and he dropped that one, but he came back here and and I thought he looked great. I thought he looked very composed and patient. And as he said, Joe McCoggan was mentioning on on the commentary that he's only been training for three years, which is quite impressive um how comfortable he looks in these positions um he he look, he doesn't look like he panics whatsoever even when you know he's he's defensively resting or anything like that and he just he, i'm very very intrigued i think i think this is the best um story line that that cage conflict have right now is they have their their flyweight champion uh jer uh jer harris and now they have uh jared burns after winning the vacant title so that's a great great fight that they can put on uh, and i think they should if they can make that fight they should lean into that because I think it's really, really fun. I put, I put up Battle of the Jairs. It's not, it's not the Battle of the Jairs. It's Jared and Jer. But these are two very, very talented fighters. Uh, and I would love to see the main event, the next show, or, or you know, if they can, maybe if not the next one, maybe the, the one after that, whenever they can make that fight, if, if they can get that to happen. Um, I think that's very intriguing and, and a really positive uh, storyline for the promotion. 
Absolutely, as uh, the great man Jerry Harris once said, there'd be a couple of high performance moves in that fight if it was ever to go down. Um, and that would be one that I would be looking forward to seeing as well. We'll move on to the co-main event. I'll stick with you, Andy. Ryan Curtis went in there. You know, Ryan came into this fight and he needed to win. And he and he came in there against an opponent that, you know, on paper, he should have been expected to be uh, beaten. And he did just that as well. You know, he, uh, he got taken down briefly at the start of the fight. Taylor looked to take the back, but Curtis scrambled really well uh, to secure top position. Um, Taylor managed to get back to his feet Curtis kind of used an underhook to control the neck and he ended up taking Taylor down landed some heavy elbows and shots um, and went on to finish the fight from that position Uh, the ref made a right call coming in and stopping the fight I know Taylor was immediately disappointed with the stoppage but there can't be any arguments over the stoppage there was multiple unanswered blows um, that Curtis were landing uh, that Curtis was landing towards the end and uh, the ref did a good job in stopping the fight you know, it's job done for for Ryan Curtis here, Andy. Really, there's not all too much to say after that. It's just kind of on to the next one, really, isn't it? Yeah, like it, it's it's good. To, I mean, it, it is good to see. You know, we don't play favorites or anything like that in in covering the sport, but it's good to see someone like Ryan Curtis getting back into the win column, um, because he really just he needed a win. Uh, and like I think you saw the golfing class. I know that you know, kind of briefly, um, Ryan Taylor looked. You know, he kind of got the takedown, and as you said, looked to take the back, but you know, seamlessly, uh, Curtis uh, reverse position into. I think he was into. Uh, side control and then uh, once he got the fight to the ground he thought he controlled it with ease to get him back down there like those were vicious elbows and strikes um, and you could kind of see by his reaction like it was he wasn't you know jumping up on the cage and screaming and shouting and celebrating it, it looks from an outsider's perspective that it was kind of like alright job done like that's we're, we're back in the win column now now, now let's go on to the next one and he, look he, need, he needed a win um, at the end of the day so I, I think I, I, we we talked about going into this fight like I thought there was a golfing class I think the golfing class showed um, because I think Ryan Curtis is a far superior fighter um, but yeah uh, on, on to the next one and yeah I'm, I'm sure it's it's probably a relief I would I would imagine to, to get back into the win column so um, hopefully it's onwards and upwards for, for Ryan Curtis absolutely absolutely yeah um, Jess Paolo was very impressive I thought in, in his victory over Blaine McGill Paolo Defended the amateur welterweight title, which he had taken from Cameron Clem- Clements on the previous show. Uh, opened up the fight, quick takedown attempt from uh, Jess. Um, he took McGill's back, was reversed. Uh, Blaine ended the round on top. It was a very heavy pace. Both fighters were blowing hard, as can be expected after the pace, after round one. Uh, round two started similar as round one, you know, um, there was a lot of clinching up against the cage in this fight. Uh, McGill was kind of had Jess's back against the cage, landing some short knees in on the inside. My opinion on the second round is that the referee should have came in a lot sooner to break that clinch in round two. He eventually did towards the end of the round. Uh, McGill landed some uh, nice shots off the break. Uh, Jess tried to close the distance to take the, take the fight back down again before the, the round ended. Um, going into round three, McGill came in, fired up, um, both traded off some nice shots at the start of round three. Um, McGill kind of threw an overhand right and looked to close the distance with a kind of a body lock takedown, but ended up getting uh, getting nicely taken down himself. It was a, a good um, outside trip into side control from Paolo that, that kind of gave him a bit of an advantage, uh, landed some shots. McGill thirdies gave up his back. Uh, Paolo took his back, locked in the rear naked choke, and it was just a really impressive performance by Jess Paolo. Not an easy fight. McGill will be disappointed maybe that, you know, it was basically the clinch that kind of got the takedown, which ultimately led to uh, the rear naked choke. So, you know, he'll be disappointed with that. But that's 5-1 and one for Jess Paolo now so far this year, and his third consecutive win. Um, very impressive from him. Quilce, we saw the debut of Alexander O'Sullivan, who um, who got a win over Matteo Picciari, uh, Picciari, excuse me, um, in uh, on his debut. What did you think of his performance overall? And you know, this is could be the start of a really exciting professional career for for one of Ireland's most decorated amateur fighters. Yeah, so like coming into this fight, I think it was probably there's a lot of talk because you know he's got the 30 amateur fights, he he's been a veteran of the amateur game and he's making this jump. So we didn't have as we don't have as many examples in Irish of it may of people who have a lot of amateur fights like you'd see in boxing, for example. So and maybe kickboxing as well. So in this case, it was very interesting to see that. And 
I guess it showed this fight proved and it showed that that biding his time at amateur, craft like learn his trade, getting better, making the mistakes at amateur, and not doing that pro, not jumping too soon. It paid off, basically. He looked fantastic, dominant from the beginning. I think he got caught once or twice, but uh, not, not by much. I think he, and uh, yeah, it was superb. That armbar was absolutely beautiful. And as I, I, you know, it was a much better opponent than he was originally scheduled for. I think it was, I was very glad with that booking. Your man, your man was no slouch. And Alexander's class showed he was absolutely fantastic. And uh, I hope this is the start of what could be a very, very good run for Alexander O'Sullivan. Like the opportunities for him are endless if he keeps going the way he is. Yeah, absolutely. It was really impressive. Like, you know, you, you could see the kind of the gulping class. I, I think Pichieri landed some nice kicks early on in that fight that mm-hmm. kind of, you know, had Alexander O'Sullivan kind of looking to adjust a little bit, but eventually got the fight down. And once the fight got down, Andy, it was it was pretty much dead and buried at that stage. Alexander worked um, into the arm bar, got a lovely arm bar belly down, and uh, Pichieri kind of got the tap. Um, straight away as soon as it was locked in very very impressive stuff from Alexander yeah I think it turned out to be great matchmaking like this because uh, I, I actually didn't realise that the opponent had changed uh, Pichieri I thought he looked quite good like as you said the kicks um, even in the grappling uh, like he was reversing position like he, I think he had Alexander down at one point it wasn't a walk in the park for Alexander but but ultimately it kind of allowed him to to show where he's comfortable in in handling situations and then and then he snatched the arm from from bottom position which was uh, that was the end so yeah really really a solid debut performance from Alexander O'Sullivan and yeah looking forward to this next one just Absolutely. to note on that as well on the back of it is like it's what I found something just I found really impressed from it is the fact that he's been coaching his team all along and like he's been tra- he's traveled to Italy with the Irish team he's coached his fighters who are out of CMAC and he's been balancing this coaching life and trying to prepare for a professional debut like to do that is re- really really impressive especially at his age as well like that is fantastic so uh yeah i'm very excited to see what happens next with him absolutely well said quilcha well said um looking down at the rest of the card we'll just uh, scoop through it relatively quickly um sam simon had a great win um two and one since his return um for, it was his his first year coming back fighting since 2014 and he's on a good run look good in his fight um there was a couple of uh owl triangle chokes to report on here creelcha i'll have to send it over to you for that i've got two owl triangle chokes and i've got another one as well in fairness but it's not a choke um so i'll start with Senan coakley he got the head kick ko but he walked out to the owl triangle i was uh, I'm pretty sure that Craig does the same <laughs> in... Uh, I was about to say, an L triangle choke, did he not head kick a lad? <laughs> head kicked a lad, but I'm pretty sure he walked out to it. I remember we were watching it at the time. Um, I'm pretty sure Craig walks out to it as well, his brother, so uh, I could be wrong with that. I think he does, which uh, I like that. It was really Kelly. good. And then that was a serious head kick. But uh, look, onto the, the owl triangle chokes and uh, Michael Shields with a lovely owl triangle and... Uh, Paddy Moran as well. There was two on the night, so a, a rare double for us at, on the night. So I, I was buzzing, I was jumping up and down. I was watching them. I tell you, that's love it. We all we love an owl triangle talk here on the owl triangle podcast. It was great to see a couple there. Um, yeah, that was pretty much it. I mean, a couple, another couple of wins as well. I I was impressed by Nicole Cameron who knocked. Uh, who kind of TKO'd Naomi Campbell on the undercard as well and there's another couple of good uh, results as well um, Cale Brennan James Wallace Ben Johnson and Sean O'Campbell all picked up wins to kick off the card as well um, we've seen Kevin Kyo, uh pick up a win on that card too but overall look at there was a lot of um, a lot of good fights a lot of good things on that card unfortunately there was a big incident inside the cage that kind of marred the event a little bit um, involving Troy Gibson and Vadim Kalashnikov, where uh, Troy Gibson was on the receiving end of a couple, not more than a, more than a couple of an eagle yeah. knees. Um, lots of confusion there. Uh, Peter Laffery was the, the referee and experienced referee completely missed the knees to a grounded opponent. So um, just to kind of break it down to anyone who hasn't seen it, but uh, I would assume a lot of people have. Uh, Troy Gibson was in. Do, you know, do you know what? Actually, I'll, I'll stick the video in here um, for, for those who haven't seen it. Yeah, exactly. Figure out your transitions to the more dominant positions. Also an opportunity to hit some frame off elbows if he can get his hand free. A new wrinkle to the game. A little bit of a cut over the left eye of Vadim. The referee. The knees to the head. Knees to the head on the ground. Knees to the head on the ground. Another knee. 
huge knee. Five or six knees to the... That, 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 the, the referee needs to stop this fight. That is a fucking... There's five or six huge knees to the head while... Um, yeah, so after watching that video, we can see that Troy Gibson inside control um, clearly down, took around 13 shots to the head, got back up in a dazed condition. Vadim Kleshnikov uh, went on the attack, landed two or three more strikes, then threw another illegal shot to the back of the head by way of hammer fist before the fight was stopped and called off as a finish. It was originally called off as a finish. Um, Peter Laffrey completely missed the illegal shots this followed a bunch of confusion inside the cage and ultimately just a bad bad finish to a fight that is pretty much unacceptable i mean peter has been around for a long time refing on the scene but this was a bad bad slip up by him i don't know i i can't explain how you miss all of those shots he was just a lapse in concentration and you just cannot afford to do that inside the cage when you're Look at fighters depend on the ref having their backs and making sure that they're safe and, and fighters are following the rules and all of that kind of failed. And unfortunately, Troy Gibson was on the receiving end. He was he was de- definitely wobbled, likely suffered a concussion. Just a mess, just a mess overall, Andy. Um looking at it and it drew a couple of chaoses. I think that Fadim Kaleshnikov didn't crown himself in any glory in the aftermath of the fight kind of going at the cut team, um, I, like not kind of showing any kind of respect to the medical staff or the cut team behind the scenes as well. And um, I think, you know, just very bad from the Kalashnikov. I mean, that's putting it lightly, to be honest. Candy, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about everything. It was disgraceful. Um, it, it was it was a, a complete and utter mess from start to finish. And... Ulti- before we before I even talk about any like the the intricacies of it, it's it's Troy Gibson received I counted thirteen shots, thirteen knees to the head, uh, illegal knees to the head, and then it was he finally got to his feet and he like he took a serious shot to put him down after it. He somehow managed to sustain you know to 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 eat those essentially, um and, and then he took a big shot and then he was very lucky that Vadim uh, Kolesnikov missed on the final coffin nail uh because that was that was aimed right to the back of the head as well um it, it's just I, I was so confused by what had happened as it when we're talking about uh peter lavery the refs um in action towards it like it was obviously an incredible it, it late is actually not even it, it wasn't late it was missed it like it was I, I i said i think i put up on the post that it was you know an obviously late stoppage but it was just a completely missed stoppage it seemed like there was a complete confusion over what had happened it, it it almost seemed um and i don't know like I, I can't speak from from peter lavery's perspective but it seemed like th- that there was an understanding that that kolesnikov had won the fight by tko for a half a second that's the, that was the feedback also that i received from anyone that was cage side that it wasn't until kind of the the uproar happened that it was like oh then the penny dropped um and it was th- that shots had been missed and look it the sad thing here is and this is just my guess it seemed as if it was an honest mistake if if that makes sense with absolutely brutal consequences and you can't have honest mistakes like that like if this was just like oh, a lapse I don't know. in judgment I mean, an honest mistake it's a detrimental mistake i mean no uh, but an honest uh, when, mistake when, uh, might be missing one but to miss 13 i think is inexcusable no but i agree i agree uh, like it, it's when i say and that's why i, I was hesitant to even saying i think he just i, I think from look, I think he just completely blanked and then realised after the fight. That's what I mean by an honest mistake. But you can't have honest mistakes like that. That's no good to Troy Gibson, who now, who knows what kind of uh, damage that's done to him for the rest of his life, let alone, you know, the next couple of months. Uh, like, it's, it, you you said there, it, it's inexcusable. Um, And I know, look, I, I don't know how you approach um something like that moving forward. As you said, he's one of the most experienced referees in Ireland. So, yeah. Yeah, he's been around like, a long like, time, which kind of confuses to, things a lot more. Like, yeah. it was an inexperienced ref. It was someone who completely wanted to see. Yeah, him. I can completely understand. Look, obviously, 
um, Cage Conflict came out with a statement after they've parted ways with the official yeah, team. Let, so let, me, let me read out yeah, that statement. Ahead. I have it ready here. Cage Conflict released a statement after the fight, and he said, they said, after last Saturday's terrible refereeing on the Troy Gibson Vadim Kleshnikov professional fight, which seen Troy being hit with 13 illegal knees to the head while on the ground, the referee was totally oblivious to what was going on, putting a competitor's life in danger. Since then, they have offered no explanation or apology to the promotion or to the fighter. Um, we have parted company with them, uh, the referee and team that was on that night. Um, uh, we, we, oh, sorry, I lost my trail of thought. We parted company with the referee and the officials and will announce a new lineup soon. These people are totally independent and nothing to do with the show and are hired as a third party to keep things totally neutral. We wish Troy a speedy recovery and we will have a huge. Uh, he will have a huge future in the in the sport. Get well soon, Troy. So that was the statement that came from Cage Conflict. And obviously, we echo the sentiments that they have at the end of that statement. Mm-hmm. We hope Troy ha- does have a speedy recovery. Um, and uh, you know, it's just a, a sad incident and a bad incident, and one that we hope we don't get to see again ever. To be honest. Cannot it can't happen. It, 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 can't, it can't happen. happen. Like we, we were just talking about there earlier on about you know fighter safety and um, brain trauma and, and all these things. It cannot happen. You cannot have a situation where like how like how Quilch, do how do you not realize? Yeah, I'm just curious to get Quilch's thoughts. Do you think the right steps were made? Uh, you think we could be looking at anything else down the line? I mean, uh, an unfortunate incident, and hopefully we can avoid it going down the line. Just uh, curious to hear your thoughts, Quilcha. Well, like in terms of steps, I think obviously get get probably getting rid of the refereeing teams they have. Look, fair enough. That's perfectly fine. There, that I don't see an issue with that after such a massive mistake. Um, I almost expected, if anything, but um, in future, I'm not sure how they're going to deal with it. But they're these, I guess, these fucking rules meetings need to be a, a bit clear if they weren't clear before because the fact that Vadim Kleshnikov went in there and after. I assume had a rules meeting and then need someone the need someone a grounded opponent what thirteen times is as Andy said an absolute disgrace, like you know, and then in fairness to Phantom I know they've said you know they've suspended him they want him to work on his stuff outside of the um, outside of the cage and he's not going to be training with them or competing them for the year or whatever maybe that is some people might find that too short, uh, not too sure what I think in it of it just yet I don't I. I wouldn't be comfortable seeing him competing in Ireland again, especially after the behavior that he had after the uh, after the event, like towards the cut team, towards the fans. Do you see him? I think he was like he was almost flipping off people in the crowd, or he was giving out to them. It was an absolute the way to handle yourself in that manner is an absolute yeah. disgrace. And uh, yeah, no, it's crazy. Like we're all, we're talking about fighter safety, and something like this pops up. Hopefully, in future there will be a lot more steps in terms of I guess I don't even know. Some of the right just, steps have been made. Sorry, guys, sorry. No, I was going to say, ju- just on that, like the, the rules meeting, I mean, it's all well and good to have a rules meeting, but when the ref misses exactly. it, the, you know, True, yeah. it's, two sides it's a bigger issue. Things can get a little bit wild in there and, and, and stuff, but yeah, ultimately, the responsibility laid down on, on Vadim yeah. not to throw the strikes, but then if you do throw the strikes, it's definitely down to the ref to make sure that that's not happening. You're warning, you're changing position, you're even disqualifying. I mean, that fight was called off as a knockout win, that which was alarming to me, mm. and it was only after the fact that the realisation hit that they were illegal blows, so... I mean, just a mess and one that we would like to move on and move forward and kind of progress with as well. Um, And hopefully it doesn't happen. I think the right moves were made by Cage Conflict um, and in their statement and same with Phantom as well, you know, removing Kleshnikov from competition. And uh, like, I mean, we'll talk to Joe in a couple of minutes and, you know, he expresses his opinion as well. And he, he kind of mentions in the interview, who's going to want to fight a guy like Fadim again? I don't. I wouldn't be sending my fighters in there to fight a, a guy like that too so too often as well. And I mean, before we move over to the to the interview with Joe, I mean, does anyone have any final say on on, on the whole incident? In terms of just how kind of when these situations happen, of how bad they can erupt, it. I I don't think it was actually picked up by national media because that you know we all know that they always like to paint. It's you typically pay, portrayed in the, MMA is portrayed in a bad light uh, whenever situations kind of occur. If there's any any chance really to be honest but um the fact that this was picked up an irish regional card was picked up by the likes of mma junkie uh 
was it Bloody Elbow? Did MMA Fighting scale up as well? Like the fact that it's been picked up by that is just, you know, it's not a good look. It's not a good look for the sport in Ireland and for that to happen. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we don't have any more cases of this happen in the future because that was. Just it hi- yeah, it, it highlights to me again that when we're looking at regulation, um, so so obviously cage conflict have parted ways with the the judging or the sorry the officials team, um, but like. I would want to see like I, I, I don't know I genuinely don't know what the right thing I don't know if you like to have like, such an experienced ref like that like is it a case that okay this one instant now they're they're done they shouldn't be ref anymore I don't know what the answer is there but there should be some sort of commission where they have a review of this and say okay you know what what needs to happen next is it a case of going and having re-education or I don't know, but there should be should be some people who know what to do in that situation there. But and we don't have that in Ireland. We don't have there is no commission of 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 sorts to be able to do something like that. There's no like Nevada State Athletic Commission. There's no New York State. You know any of this type of stuff where you see on the UFC a, a referee has a terrible night. They might take them off or like say if they're they've been elevated to a main event spot. All right, you're not getting those big uh, fights anymore. And there's you know they kind of manage uh, which refs they're putting in there. So uh, I don't know what needs to. Happen. Happen, but but something needs to there needs to be some sort of um recourse or education or i i don't know what um and then secondly recognition yeah, just, is the word because with recognition comes comes all of these guidelines that promotions and everybody has to follow and i think you know this incident really underlines the need for that regulation and for a body to kind of handle these incidents or to ensure that they don't happen down the line before a serious incident happens again like i said and this is a serious incident yeah this like i mean yeah i mean this is uh, i mean a serious incident in regards to like someone getting badly badly hurt i know Mm. troy gibson is badly injured and probably concussed after eating those knees luckily you know he didn't go unconscious or suffer any bad uh like he could have had his jaw broken he could have had a orbital fracture off those knees you know because those are heavy shots so thankfully you know, it's not ideal. He, he didn't realize it. He didn't. He did an interview. He, uh, he he didn't realize that what had happened until someone showed him a video. Mm-hmm. That's what happens, like, and we can't be going that, down that yeah. road. But look, at we'll we'll move on to Joe McCulgan, who was cage side for that. We'll talk a little bit more about about what he's seen from cage side and his thoughts about the uh, cage conflict card, a couple of incidents that happened, and and about his own career as well and where he is at. Um, in his fighting career and a couple of other things as well. So we'll continue on the conversation with Joe and I'm going to let Andy take that one away. And now we're joined by Fat Joe McCalgan back in the mix. How are you? Sorry, Joe McCalgan. The Cage Warriors. I don't, know if, I don't know if we can call you the Cage Warriors lightweight champion anymore, but the Cage Warriors lightweight champion in our hearts. Joe McCalgan, how are you doing today, sir? Yeah, very good. Very good. The former, um, the no longer uh, Cage Warriors champion, but yeah, feeling good. Um, yeah. It's strange actually being back on a podcast. I mean, I haven't actually done one. I, I don't think I've actually done a podcast. I did one maybe after winning the title, like so that was a year and a half ago. So this is the feels feels strange being back on a podcast. I was thinking it's been a while since we've heard from you in general, like not you know from mm. most talkers or, or anyone really. Mm-hmm. Um, happy belated birthday! It was your birthday a few Thank days you. ago. Would you get up to anything nice? Yeah. Uh, no, just a year older, unfortunately. Um, that's about it. You know, when you get to my old age, you don't really get presents, so. Just if you're closer to 40, is it? Yeah, pretty much. I'm on the wrong <laughs> side of 35 now, unfortunately. I know I don't Do look you... it, but yeah, I'm old. Uh, you don't look over 21. Do you and uh, and Paul Redmond exchange presents each year, or, or how does that work? <laughs> well, I know it's funny. I'm born on the same day. He's the exact same age as me. As, so, And I actually, whenever... Like, see, when I was 29, I thought I was too old for MMA. And I would just look at Paul Redden and be like, well, we're the exact same age. So every year from whenever I found out that Paul was the same age as me, so from 29, I was like, yeah, Paul's still, Paul's still fighting away. So, you know, it's funny. You're, you're using him as your, your benchmark. So I'd say once he retired, you're yeah, thinking, yeah. oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I always actually did that. I was always like, well, I mean, they're in the UFC and they're 37 and they're fighting. So I'm still OK. You know, still got a few more years. And then next thing you know, you are actually really old and you're like, fuck. <laughs> I didn't yeah. listen to the UFC. Well, thank you for joining us today on the L Triangle. Uh, we have a lot that we want to talk to you about. There's been a whole lot of stuff going on. Uh, you're moonlighting at the moment as, as a commentator for Cage Conflict. <laughs> And you were there cage side um, last weekend, which was obviously a, a fairly wild event. Um, how, how are we enjoying the, the commentating so far anyway? Yeah, the commentating is really good. Um, 
it's actually really really difficult because you're trying to it's hard to know like obviously you can like talk through a fight but you have to kind of gear towards the audience so you have to really not dumb everything down but like kind of give an, a high level overview of like the different positions and stuff and it's actually just really really difficult and the first time i did it um i was kind of like i was being ultra common like ultra like complimentary towards the fighters because i was thinking nobody's really going to watch this it's only going to be the fighters watching the fight back so the last thing they want to hear is me sitting and slabbering about them saying they're not doing this and not doing that so i was kind of think putting myself in their shoes as a young amateur thinking oh that'll be class here and some what good th- saying good things about me so that then for the second one i was like i'm just going to speak the truth and you know i think some fighters might actually be like that dickhead what is he what was he saying <laughs> You know, I was pretty like I was I was critiquing a lot of them. So I think for the the next one, I might just try and find a balance between the two. And, you know, every time it's just like it's just like anything. You want to be good at it. Um, I don't want to half ass it. So but I am really enjoying it. Yeah. Did you get any fighters uh, give it out to you after? No, 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 like no, nobody really said anything other than like a, a couple of people like have reshared the videos and like where I have been complimenting them. And they're like, oh, yeah, thank you or whatever. But. No, no one, I, I, no one's like really said to say, "What were you talking about?" You know nothing. <laughs> I think because what I am saying is the truth. Like you know, if a fighter's lying on his back and he's not really being active, what does he expect to gain from that fight? You know, if you're just going to lie on your back, you're going to lose the fight. You know, you need to be doing more. You know, if their coaches aren't telling them that, then they can listen to the commentary. But that's the truth. That's the that's the fact of the matter. You know. Yeah. Well, you had a lot to talk about there at that last show, and I think the main takeaway. You know, it wasn't it wasn't really the main event, unfortunately. The main takeaway from that event was the kind of crazy situation that happened in the Troy Gibson and Vadim Kolesnikov fight, uh, where obviously Troy, you know, I think everyone has seen the video now, Troy sustained uh, a crazy amount of damage from about 13, that I could count anyway, illegal strikes. Um, mm-hmm. What was it like being cage side for that fight? And, and, you know, yeah, could you give us some insight as to what it was like on site at the event? Yeah, the, actually being there in person, it was it, the, the shots like seemed a lot more damaging than, than what you can see on the video. I don't know if it's the angle, maybe kind of dulls it down a bit. But whenever you're actually eye level with the action, it, it, Troy's head was just, as he every knee that was hitting the temple, his head was just boom, bobbling and bobbling, like and and they're all like bone on bone. So your bone of your knee to the temple uh like which isn't a really strong part of the the skull it's not great and he was throwing everything into it it was just it was just a crazy thing to watch um and immediately we were everyone was kind of like oh my god there are legal shots like stop it and then because nobody was stopping it i was thinking are they illegal shots i started second guessing myself because the referee was doing absolutely nothing and you know, you saw what happened. Troy kind of stum, like kind of fell off a side control, and Vadim got up and just one punch, and and Troy was out. And uh, yeah, it was just uh, it was just crazy. I don't know what what Peter Lavery was was thinking. Clearly, he wasn't thinking. Um, you know, the referee's there. He's there to protect you when you can't protect yourself. And you know, he really let Troy down. You know, because. Fair enough. Oh yeah, I made I made a mistake. You make mistakes at work. Everybody makes mistake makes mistakes at work, but that mistake could cost Troy. Yeah, Troy walks out and he's got he's one and zero now. But what what damage is that those thirteen legal shots done to him? How is that going to impact his career? Moreover, how is that going to impact the rest of his life when he's sixty years of age? And they're like, there's some weird abnormalities in your brain. Myth. What's going on here? They were all like knees to the temple. There are reason. There's a reason why they're illegal shots. You know, it's just it was really unfortunate, especially and it's hard because it's your teammate. It would have been hard watching it regardless, but um, it just wasn't great. And I was actually saying on the commentary that that guy Vadim is. I I I, I, I was in the corner for Sean McCormick when Sean McCormick fought him, and it was he is just a dangerous person. Take him out of it. He's just a dangerous person. You know, anytime you're in a clinch with him, anytime you're in close contact with him, he's going to be trying to do damage. It doesn't matter what the rule set is. You know, he probably, the only reason he's probably not biting people is because he's got a gum shield in. He's just like, he's a maniac. And just, I was actually saying this on the commentary. And then literally five seconds later, 
it's like these legal legal knees like i mean we can also blame the referee but you also have to blame for like how do you not know that they're legal shots like yeah not, like, like he, he was he wasn't even like he was confused after the fight was over like putting his hands up he had like no idea what was going on at all joe which was quite confusing to me and maybe that played a factor in peter not reacting the way we were expecting him to react as well it was just such a strange scene there, but hopefully Troy is doing all right now and he's recovered somewhat after it. Is, is he? I actually haven't spoken to Troy. I'd say I'd say he's all right, like, but uh, there's probably he's probably got, a, probably got a big concussion there. But you'll start to soon see the effects of that or how what damage has been really been done whenever he starts sparring again. And, you know, maybe his ability to, to take shots isn't really there. Um, I remember I, I you know, after one of my fights, I fought a guy at Medivin Lactor and. Oh, he like really beat the fuck out of me in the third round. It was really bad, but and I remember I was so compromised in spars for the next six months. Like, it, like the smallest shot, I would have been flashed, and you know, we'd seen floaters in my eye and stuff. So, you know, after the fight, I was okay, but again, like it's kind of like the kind of the months that lead after that. That's when you really start seeing the damage. So hopefully he's okay. Hopefully, um, you know, he can get back into training, and there's no side effects or anything. But yeah, like I mean, the refer the referee and his opponent really let him down there. I suppose the scary thing is that we we won't really know uh, to what extent the damage will be, or we we may never know. Um, you know, how, just how much it'll impact him kind of going forward long term. But uh, we obviously only could see what was on the screen and and you know you know yeah. what, what was inside the cage. Was there anything you know? What, what was it like after that fight? At it up in Belfast, um, was there any discussions you know with the referee? I heard that there was some kind of commotion backstage as well with, with Vadim not wanting to be treated because like it wasn't even just the the illegal knees, it was kind of the behaviour afterwards towards the, the cuts team and uh, it just seemed like it was a very chaotic scene up there. Yeah, well, I actually didn't see. I only saw the, the way he was getting on with the, the cut woman on a video after, which is fucking insane, but, um, you know, it's just the type of person he is. Like, he's when he's in the cage, he, he it's almost like, you know, he's just out of control, wild. Um, you know, he's like a wild animal that can't be tamed, which is madness. Like you're not going to be successful if that's your, if that's your mindset in the cage. You need to be smart. You need to make. You need to be making like split second decisions. How can you do that when you don't have control of your own body? Um, but that's and then after when he left the cage, I think there's loads of people in the crowd throwing things at him. Um, and then there seemed to be like a bit of a melee over at the. Like where Troy was getting seen to, well, Troy was getting seen to in one area, and then there was a load of people trying to get into where Vadim was. And I know that there's a couple of boys from our gym, one one guy, um, was trying to get at him as well, obviously because it's our teammate. Um, so it was just it was just a bit wild. And then Troy, Troy's mum and dad were there as well, and it's Troy's girlfriend, so that must have been quite upset. And I know that seemed to be quite upsetting to them. Um, but yeah, I think it all kind of calmed down a wee bit. Um. But yeah, like what do you expect? You go into West Belfast and you you do something like that, you, you're not going away. So you're not getting away that scot free. Like everyone's going to try and get after you. But um, yeah, like I, I can't imagine he's going to be allowed to fight on 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 any show really. Like who? Yeah. Like who? Who would like want to fight him? Like if you're say you're like five and pro or any kind of professional, would you want to go in there and fight him? Like like I wouldn't. You know, it's not it's not worth it. What about what about Peter Lavery? Would you want to go in that fight and he's refereeing? Like everyone thinks that a fighter is always in control of the situation, and that's absolutely not the case. Say I'm shooting in at someone and I'm like down at their hips and they're like you know split stance. There's a, there's shots there you can hit like the elbow and you see like you see loads of people hit, getting hit with elbows, but there's a real fine line between getting hit on the side of the head and hitting the top of the head. And sometimes a fighter can get out of control, but I don't need to worry about that because the referee will let the fighter know not to do that. So I don't need to be worrying about what the fighter's doing to me, you know, from from areas that I can't see. So if I if I go in and if, if I I wouldn't I wouldn't be letting Peter referee my fight after that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I, I mean, but it's just a it's just a, a catastrophic mistake that you just can't. It's unforgivable, really. 
Yeah, so Cage Conflict put out, you know, the statement afterwards that they were parting ways with that official's team. And, and mm-hmm. I know that Phantom MMA Ireland, they put out uh, a statement as well that they were kind mm-hmm. of banning, I, put, I suppose, a self-imposed ban on, on Vadim for a year on any sort of competition or, 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 tr- or combat sports training and for him to go away and, you know, kind of, well, I guess the, the way it was phrased was work on himself outside the cage. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you're a guy who is from from my perspective has always approached this as a sport like it's not mm-hmm. it, it's not you know it's not war it's a sport for for you yeah. uh, and you were successful at it and um as someone who who is a fighter and you know uh, a veteran of the Irish scene mm-hmm. what's your what's your take on all this like what do you think should happen or or what safeguards should be put in place to protect fighters well the safeguards are already in place it's the referee what more do you need you just need the referee to do their job like you know, you see, like, the likes of Herb Dean getting loads of critique about, like, you know, maybe he was a split second too late jumping in. Well, that, like, your old referees are always going to get that. They're never going to get make a decision that satisfies everybody. There's always going to be some people are going to be upset with it or some people are, are, aren't are upset with it. But 100% of people would be up, are, are upset about the, the Peter Lavery mistake because he was asleep at the wheel. Um, I don't know what he was thinking, but had nobody told him what had happened, he would have. He thought he thought that Vadim won by TKO. I'm almost sure he had to be told that no, there were like illegal shots. It seemed he was very confused. That's that's the way it looked on screen. Is that it, it was kind of almost after the fact, which makes sense why it went on for so long. Yeah, but I, I don't know. Like I just don't, I just don't know what what was he, he. I had to be looking at the fight. Um, sure, he would have. I don't know. I, 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 you need to ask him. Yeah, I would say it's, it was. I, it's pretty crazy, like. It was it was a wild scene. Um, and look, look, we've uh, we've a lot to talk to you about today, so we'll we'll move on, and, and the other lads will will jump in there in a second. But but let's talk about you, Joe. Um, you know we haven't we haven't heard from you, we haven't seen from you in a while. Um, I know you've been you've been training here and there, but what is the current? You know, you won the title, as you said, June twenty twenty one. We didn't see you on the Belfast show this year. Um. What is the plan for Joe McCog and where does your your career um, lie at the moment? Uh, I th- I th- like I don't know. I just I, I'm just focusing on other parts of my life at the moment. You know, like work and family and things like that, and the house and you know, uh, I was when I got the title that, that was a big deal for me and I can't like that was a, a big milestone that sometimes I didn't even think I'd ever get to myself. And um, so whenever I got there, I was kind of like, right, well. That's a big, massive check in the box there. Um, so I just kind of started focusing on other things, and it, I wasn't precious to the title either. So if you know, to let the division move on, to let the division move on, I, I kind of said to Graham and Ian, I was like, listen, just I'll I'll run across the belt, and whoever's next in line, they they can fight for the belt or whatever. So that was never an issue for me, letting go of the belt or anything. I'd kind of been there, done that type of thing. So. Um, I just kind of, I am, you know, I'd probably say that I'm pretty much done at this stage. But, you know, until I, I say I'm 100% out, you know, uh, there's always a chance. But, I mean, you know, I'm just, uh, like, you know, if I if I don't train for a week, that's no problem to me. Like, I don't, I don't, like, I'm not missing it. I'm not going, oh, I need to get back to the gym. I need to have, you know, a fight on the horizon or things like that. I just don't seem to be that way anymore whereas I used to be I used to always be like oh definitely I need to have a fight even like know roughly where I want to be in six months time but I, I don't feel like that anymore Um, I don't really miss the sport too much anymore so you know what does that tell you it's yeah so I mean it sounds like you're you're not quite ready to say you're retired yet but it's mm. it, it's it's trending in that direction maybe yeah, like of course, yeah, but it naturally would anyway because I'm 36 years of age, so you know you gotta be thinking like that. And if if I was to call it quits, I, I definitely think it's early. Like I, I have a lot, I have a lot more left than me. Um, like I haven't really taken much damage. Um, I still feel like my like you know my style is is a hard style of eight, and I've, like my cardio and everything's good. I don't feel like I was ever slowing down or anything like that. And you could probably tell from my performances, like the last two performances, I was just, you know, probably the best I've ever been. And I still feel like I was getting better. So, you know, it, it, it would be early, but I would rather be much early than, than late, it, like when leaving this game, for sure. And I kind of feel like 
I'm lucky in the sense that I don't feel like this massive burden to keep fighting. Um, because if I did, if I if I did say that that was my last fight, then that's fine. That's not the problem. Yeah. There's lots of other stressful things on going on in life to worry about and focus on. You know, it's not all about MMA, and it never was for me. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, I, I, sorry, go ahead, Andy, sorry, Andy, and that like it just brings me to the perfect point that I was going to ask you, Joe. MMA wasn't always number one with you the whole way throughout your career. You, you, mm-hmm. You've separated your family life and obviously your professional career outside the cage as well, mm-hmm. which is pretty unique when it comes to a fighter who, like, generally speaking, when you're fighting, you have to be super selfish. You have to put all of that in the rearview mirror. You chose mm-hmm. not to do that from a very early stage. What was kind of the decision based around that for you? Um, I, I don't know. I think... It's hard, it's hard to tell. I don't know. Probably just like family and stuff and my wife, they're kind of got like a good outlook on, on sport in general. So they kind of keep me grounded. And um, yeah, so I probably, I probably credit that to them. And yeah, it just, it just, just doesn't make sense to me. Like, you know, logically, think about it. It's 15 years of your life. You live until you're like 80, 85, 90 or whatever. You know, that's a very small portion of your life. Um, what like why would you put all your eggs in the one basket? I'm fair. I'm fairly risk adverse, like so. I would kind of probably <laughs> think, oh, you're probably not going to make it. You're probably not going to like make millions out of MMA because most people won't. Like, there's only like the the very small minority. So, like, if you think about guys who are like pretty successful now, <laughs> like how like you know what are they going to do for the rest of their life? Surely, the, the, their ability to make money can't just end there like you know 35 36 you know they've got the rest of their life to make money and stuff and if you've put all your eggs into that one basket it's going to be hard to kind of have a life after mma i think but a lot of those guys are probably going to coaching or they might have other things going on i'm just kind of generalizing here but yeah for me i was just like um, i wouldn't be prepared to do that i would like i I liked mma i I loved it and you know it pretty it pretty it pretty much was like a hobby for me i would say i would say yeah pretty much a hobby that i took quite seriously you know i was i didn't train as much as the the pros and also i say again on the interviews and say uh train xyz but that that never really was the case apart from the last two fights i was training like consistently twice a day um so you were bullshitting us (laughs) <laughs> yeah 100 percent. but everyone bullshits you leading up to the fight because every every time you're fighting it's the best camp you've got no injuries and that is bullshit because it never is the best camp yeah it's always the worst camp the most stressful and you you're <laughs> riddled with injuries so, <laughs> so i wasn't training twice a day yeah. you could but have yeah, picked, no, you like, could have picked an easier hobby or hobby for yourself Joe, uh, rather than I, know, getting in. <laughs> I know i know i know I, I don't think a lot of people realize that you have quite a successful job outside of mma joe well it's quite a stressful job so it is um yeah, it's it's kind of like we actually talked about it. It's like, you know, if you if, if I got my wife in here and said and got her to tell you what my job was, she'd be like, ah, <laughs> I'm like Chandler Bing. It's like <laughs> I'm a transponder. <laughs> I basically do project management for a tech company over in the states. So it's kind of it's just it's it's hard work, um, uh, and that's kind of why I like. I actually don't think to do it like. I've kind of reached the level in in work uh, and the level in MMA that where uh, you can't. It's not feasible to do both. To continue at that level, one would have to to give way, and for me, it would never be my professional career. It would have to be in MMA. I would never have like sacrificed that for MMA. Joe, Joe you mentioned you're a bit risk av- risk averse. Um, so like looking forward, and obviously, I know you're not fu- you're not fully calling it a day, and you're open to maybe a few maybe another fight, but does in like seeing stuff like what happened to Troy and seeing kind of the safety aspect of the sport and the risk that that has of your like what can happen in the rest of your life, the impact that can have on you in the future, does that mm-hmm. have an impact on the, the decision to fight and pursue it even further? Oh, 100 percent. Because and it, but it's not just a fight for me. It would be the the training camp. It's the training camp where the damage is done because you're actually having to sign up to getting really hard spars against like spar sparring whenever you're leading up to a fight camp in the gym isn't just like doing around here and there it's actually like you've got three guys lined up two or three guys and they're going to be hitting you fresh in the cage 
you're going to be exhausted and it's for 30 minutes. So it's like six, five minute rounds. And it, it's, it's really, really grueling. Um, and you can get big shots there and you kind of just have to grind your way through it. And I think that there's only so many of them you can really do. Um, and I just, the thought of having to do that again, it's not the fight that I kind of, I, I worry about it's more the actual training, committing to training, all those hours, lack of sleep, and then those those brutal spars. It's definitely, you know, for me, it's always it's always been like about like I don't want to spar hard at all because you know you've only got one brain, and every time you take a shot, it's kind of taken away from you know your kind of your mind really. Um, you don't want to be taking too much damage to the brain, so I definitely that's always kind of played a factor in my whole approach to MMA. Would, would you have uh, taken, you know, many big concussive shots in your career? No, no, but I've taken enough that I know that there's going to be damage in later life. And I think I, out of everyone I know, I've by far taken the least amount of shots. What, like I, what do you make of the kind of brain scans that come in then in, when it comes to shots to the head and how they've been used they to kind of... They, don't, they, 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 aren't, they aren't used for brain damage. They're actually, so those brain scans are, are looked at standalone. So it doesn't matter if I've had five brain scans, you don't have, the, the, the doctor isn't going, right, okay, this is the one he got in 2020. This is the one he got in 2021. There's 20, oh, there's degeneration here in this part of the brain. No, no, they don't, they don't do that. They actually just look at the brain scan from 2022. Are there any abnormalities? No, done, approved. Half my brain could be missing from the previous scan, and they, they they still wouldn't do that kind of like retrospective analysis of it, like the, or the comparative analysis are. And um, so, I, I don't think that they. I think that they're they're good to find like abnormalities and things, and but I don't think I, they could be better. But then again, you're gonna have to pay money for that. You're gonna have to pay for like a, a doctor to actually like do that full analysis. And I, my my friend's a radiologist, and he said there's actually probably with only having like a brain scan here looking at one thing and then a brain scan two years later there's actually very little you can you can really do so i don't think they're uh for the purpose of like seeing like damage during a fighter's career i don't think those brain scans really help joe you're very on the ball when it comes to you know being aware of the you know the very real dangers of the sport do you think it's talked about enough amongst fighters or that fighters themselves acknowledge it enough yeah, like I mean, I think, I think they do, but I don't. I think they're kind of saying, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, not they're even out of sight, out of mind. It's just kind of like that's par for the course, you know. You're kind to... of programmed not to think that way, really. Like you yeah. know, you're going in there with your training and your preparation, and yeah, you're preparing your body, but you're also p- preparing mentally as well. And you have to be somewhat a little bit dis- disillusional, really, if you're getting in there to fight and 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 be mm-hmm. comfortable with the fact that there is going to be damage there. It's yeah. yeah. It's crazy. It's a crazy mindset to get into, really. Yeah, but it's, the fight, the fight. I think the fight's fine. Okay, right. You've signed up for a fight. It's fifteen minutes. Like, oh, you're gonna hit. That's that's fine. But it's actually the eight weeks before. It's if you're sparring like two, three times a week. I just think that's mental. Like, like you're gonna go into the fight compromised. Like you're gonna either be injured, you're gonna have cuts, and you see all those things. They're all kind of superficial. The cuts, the bruises. But what what's actually happening inside? It's cr- it's it's crazy to me. Um, but like, I, if if I if if I do call it a day, like I I definitely won't be jumping back in for sparring ever again. No way. It's not enjoyable grapple and, and things and wrestle, but never sparring. No way. Joe, we've got a big big fight coming up. Uh, for a very close teammate and friend of yours, Paul Hughes, unification mm-hmm. bout against Jordan Vucenic. Um. <clears throat> Have you been? Have you seen much of Paul this camp? I know he was out at Killcliff, formerly uh, Sanford MMA, uh, for a bit. But obviously, he's very heavily training in FAI, his home gym. Um, mm-hmm. Give us some insight into where is Paul at right now and your thoughts on on this fight. I, I actually haven't seen Paul since he went away to to St. Art Killcliff. Yeah, but I haven't been in the gym since he's been back. Well, I was up. I was up today, but it was his rest day today. So I actually, I've, I've been speaking to, but I haven't been in training with him. But before he left, he's just kind of. Paul's just like on a different level at the moment. Um, he's and he's always kind of been on a different level. He's always kind of been like he separates himself from the pack a wee bit. Um, and I think that 
yeah, this is definitely going to be his, his toughest fight. I think it's for both of them. It's going to be their toughest fights. Uh, but Paul always finds a way to kind of dig deep in these fights and, and find a way to win. Like the only exception is the Jordan Pachanic one the last time, but I definitely think that he won that fight. I think, I, I don't think, I don't see how anyone would think that he didn't win that last fight. Uh, but again, uh, Paul's improved, Jordan's improved, so it's going to be really interesting to see like how those improvements affect the flow of the fight. Um, I just think that Paul is going to be too much for him, style-wise. I just think that Paul, uh, Jordan, um, Jordan's style is good, but Paul's style is like a bad matchup for him, and I think Paul's probably going to get the finish, to be honest with you. I don't think, I don't see it going the full five rounds. You think there's more kind of a, a a kind of a push maybe to get the finish, considering that the decision didn't go his way the last fight, and how uh, important is it for him to kind of find that fine balance in you know letting the fight naturally progress rather than pushing for the finish, where you can kind of leave a few openings for your opponents as well. Well, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Paul Paul's actually really kind of um, an intelligent fighter. I know he looks sometimes he looks in there, he's a kind of wild and ultra aggressive. But he's actually really, really intelligent. He makes he makes a lot of the times he makes the right decisions in those cr- crazy chaotic um, situations. I don't think that he would ever be like, "I need to get the finish." I think he would be happy just kind of like letting the fight go to the decision. Um, I think Paul Style is always looking for the finish, but he wouldn't kind of try and advance a position or sorry, give up a position just to try and jump on something just to get the finish. I think he's kind of I think he's mature in the sense that he he just makes the right decisions in the fights, and if if he feels like it's it's going the distance, then that that wouldn't even be an issue. He wouldn't be thinking, "Oh, I need to get the finish." Unless he was down, and he clearly knew he was down, then yeah, he would be pushing the pace a wee bit and trying different things, taking taking risks. But I don't think that's ever going to be an issue for him, and I don't think he feels like there's going to be uh, a need to get the finish. Just just the victory. All he needs is a win. All either of them need is a win, and the UFC is there. So it's a big fight for both of them. A lot of pressure on both of them. Um, I, I'm so excited for it. I'm actually Wait. almost like, go ahead. No, no, go finish, finish your thought. I'm almost like I actually wish I was just able to watch it in the crowd. I'll be, I'll be in the corner, but I'll, it'd be great to actually just sit there in the crowd and watch it. It's going to be an amazing fight. I was going to ask, where has Paul improved the most since that last fight? Um, ah, oh, just everywhere. Really, wrestling is just unbelievable. Um. It's it's really weird. Um, I think I think you just improve everywhere, but it's just his ability to flow in different situations where people are like going up. Like so, if 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 you're against the cage, and one person's going mental trying to get you down, scramble, scramble, like different chain in different positions. Paul's barely even breathing. Like he's just flowing through the motion. He's not being static. He's actually going with the person. Um, he's just so comfortable in every single position in the grappling exchange. It's re- it's really enjoyable to watch, um, and his striking is like put it this way: I don't spar Paul anymore. That's that's all I'll say. And I was I consider myself a striker, and I I do not spar him. Just he's he's he's, he's he hits hard like, and he's just you know for a featherweight like he's he's a big digger. <laughs> If you were to give a prediction for that one, how do you think you, if you see it going? Like a method? Uh, I think I think Paul could, I think Paul has the skills to finish the fight either on the feet or on the ground. Um, I don't I don't know. I don't like in predictions, especially not for my fight, especially when it's actually one of my teammates. So I'm gonna opt out of that. But I Fair definitely idea. think Paul has the skills, the mindset, um. The physical attributes and the IQ to go in there and dominate Jordan and finish him. Do you think it's UFC next if he gets the win? Has to be. It could not be. Has to be. And it's the same for Jordan. Has to be the UFC. There's no like I don't. It, it just it's the right thing to do. Like you go to Cage Warriors. Cage Warriors the proven ground, and both guys have proved it. And this is their final test. So whoever gets this gets the call of the UFC. And if that wasn't the case, you'd be like, what well, is the point in Cage Warriors? Do you know what I mean? It's like that's what Cage Warriors is there for. Both guys have done everything they've been asked of. And this is the kind of, as I said, the final test. So winner goes to the UFC, in my opinion. Joe, you were 
there was a lot of controversy earlier on this year around Matthew Elliott and, and the Shelley fight and the result around that. Um, mm-hmm. Was there any kind of big lessons that you learned as a corner man or your team learned as a result of that? Obviously, scoring was a, a high topic of conversation around that fight as well. How mm. important do you feel it is as a corner man or as a coach to kind of you know develop your knowledge on the scoring of a fight and what judges are looking at um, scoring at in a fight as well? It's actually really it's re- it's really difficult because I don't think there's there's no consistency whatsoever. I I thought I couldn't believe that Matthew lost that fight, and I I was like, how, how is that possible? Like it was so close. I actually went through. I got out a spreadsheet and I was like, pause the action. He landed one elbow. That then I was writing down each of the different shots for each of the fighters, and I was like, well, in that round Matt landed more, in this round. Shelly landed more, and I was like, I started, so I, I text Sean Sheehan, and Sean Sheehan gave me a breakdown of the, the 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 scores, and you know the rounds that I thought the Matt won, he gave it to Shelly, and I was like, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense, um, and I, it's like, it's like, it's all about damage, it's all about damage, but then. Like it's damage is so subjective. Like, what is a hard shot? Are you in there taking the shot? You know, how can you judge how hard a shot is, especially in a fight where there is, you know, both fighters should be like looking at themselves and going, "There's I landed fuck all damage in that there. Nobody should have won that." In terms of if they're just marking on damage, but Matt was the aggressor. Matt had the cage control. Matt had the takedowns. Yes, takedowns and control it like isn't the number one scoring criteria. But when the number one scoring criteria is balanced, then it should go to those things. So I think everybody needs to be educated, judges included. There's just no consistency, so it's hard to kind of <clears throat> know as a as a coach or a fighter, um, you know what what you need to be doing. But yeah, it's, it's just it, it's just really difficult, and I don't know what the what the answer is, um, other than just giving everybody time to understand and get aligned on the rule set and the, the scoring criteria. But like we were like if you look at cage conflict, there's like. Phew, like some fights, you're like, well, if 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 the, the scoring criteria is applied, then this fighter should have won, but instead fighter B won, and it's like, and then if you apply the same for like it just there was no there's no consistency ever. Yeah, there seems to be a little discrepancy as well in the way some fights at amateur have scored in comparison to the pro ranks as well, which I feel doesn't kind of help things either. Where you're kind of rewarding that position and the grappling exchanges and control time a little bit more in the amateur. Yeah. Um, in comparison to the pro, and I think that confuses things a little bit as well. But you know, I, I definitely agree with you. Education is important, but you know, a little bit of um, consistency in the scoring as well is also needed. They should have. They should have like see for the UFC. They should actually have like a, a judging expert on, um, not commentating, but like giving his analysis in the like in between the rounds. So he's explaining, okay, this is what we were looking for in round one. As you can see, Fighter A was doing this, so I think that gives him more points than Fighter B. And then the, the people at home are looking at that, or like the fighters are watching the replays back, and they're going, "Okay, right, I can see what what's happening there." And then they're kind of applying that and going, "Right, okay, it's so the second round. Well, he actually did this, so maybe 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 he would have got that round then." So that kind of triggers that education thing. I think Sean Sheehan would be perfect for it, apart from his strong, thick accent. But he's so knowledgeable, <laughs> and he ex- but he explains things really, really well. Yeah. And I think that. Someone like him, they get that on in the year. All the big promotions should be cage warriors. Should, they should be doing it as well. Because you, like you can't, it, it's like it's like a top secret. Well, we're the judges. We we here's here's the, here's the judging criteria. But you're not allowed to see how I came up with that ten nine. It's like I should like it's just kind of we trust that the judges make the right decisions. But they they should be held more accountable. They have to explain themselves, and you know I think that's the only way. Yeah, indeed, a couple of good points there. The gym in FAI has kind of been on a bit of a surge the last, I guess, two years. I know last year you won the Severa May Irish Gym of the Year. What's kind of happened over the last two years for the gym to kind of progress as much as it has? Is it all those steps that you're running up or like what are you doing over there? <laughs> um, I, just, I just think that we have, you know, for a long time in Bogas, like we were like me, Shando, uh, and Pat, the two head coaches would have talked about like, we live in the hardest hard west Belfast. You know, there's kind of there's a lot of social deprivation, and you would think that having an MMA gym in the heart of that would like attract kids who have nothing else to do. 
like all these talented kids you hear about all these talented boxers in northern ireland there's a gym in every corner well there's a, an mma gym the best mma gym in the country on your corner and nobody was coming to it <clears throat> so there was kind of that kind of grassroots uh, entry in the mma didn't really exist but now it does so we run like beginner mma courses and it's a try like they're packed like 50 people every session and then you're starting to get people who are actually really talented and they're coming through and then they're they're going kind of through the ranks in the gym and you got this like squad of really kind of unreal amateurs now and you have all these people on the mats and then you know you have the pros there the pros are seeing our success from other gyms and they're moving to our gym it's kind of in northern ireland it's like the hub of mma excellence fight academy ireland and i think just iron sharpens iron you know um and I think all gyms kind of go through this because I remember there's other gyms when I, when I was like kind of starting, everyone would have congregated around like certain gyms and then it changed gyms. But now it's definitely, it's definitely Fight Academy Ireland. And we've got the facilities and we've got the coaches. I mean, obviously Shando was there for striking and he like is the orchestrator of everything. <clears throat> and he's been through MMA, he's fought high level as well. And um, so he has the respect of all the boys. Um, and then you have Pat, another competitor, but Pat's wrestling classes and Pat does a lot of like extra sessions. I, it's actually incredible. I don't know how he has the time. He has a full, like a, like a serious full time job as well. And, and does the MMA almost like virtually full time. Um, so, you know, a combination of having amazing coaches um, some talented pros and a squad of amateurs and a real hard, strong work ethic, and now two world title belts in the gym, three, if you can't race. Uh, how, how, like, you know, <laughs> it's just like, kind of like, you know, success breeds success. So I think it's just kind of going to get keep getting better and better. And the best guys in Fight Academy Ireland are not the guys that are the best right now. They are going to be these amateurs that are coming through because some of them are just frighteningly good. Um, and you, you'll be expecting... Time. You'll be expecting an FAI hunter coming along quick, pretty quickly then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's it. I think there actually was one previously. I don't know. Maybe yeah. shot those. So. <laughs> well, speaking of the guys, you know, the younger guys that are kind of breaking through, uh, Paddy McCarry has stepped up to take on a, a huge fight against James Webb in two weeks' time. Um, this, this took me by complete surprise and I've seen, I can't remember if it was Kyle McClurkin or, or, or who it was, but someone put it up that this is this is going to be Joe McCoggan versus Peter Queeley too um, in that Paddy McCarry is, you know, he's only, uh, what, 2-0 and taking on a former Cage Warriors champion in his Cage Warriors debut. Uh, tell us a little bit about Paddy and, and were you surprised that he, that he took this fight? No, not even surprised because the night before we were wrestling and Paddy, Paddy was like stormed over to me we were doing rounds and i was like Fucking hell and he was like i need like he just thought it was like i need to fight them ready to fight blah 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 and we were just chatting like you know look you can put out some things because he actually has found the hard find it really hard to get matched he was my method fighting cage warriors in belfast and his opponent put out and they couldn't get him a replacement so it's been kind of like things like that that's kept patty out of the uh out of the cage for a while and I, I actually said i was like Phew. like you know like i mean they're like the like, likes of james webb and all like you know his fight could put through that'll be a dream matchup and then literally the next morning you know ian text pat and pat like i was like look at this after we were talking about last night you know it was a no-brainer for patty to take that fight um it's a very good style matchup for patty patty's just pat, pat you know i could tell you that patty's the one of the best strikers i've ever been with i could tell you he is i don't like grappling with him um, you know, he's just, you know, he's got a really strong mindset. He's a very intelligent fighter. He's a young guy, you know, that hasn't had, like, you know, he's just kind of, he's had to work hard for where he's at right now. But I can tell you all these things, but you'll just see it. You'll see it in two weeks' time, and you'll be like, this kid is just special. There's always that one kid who's just, like, you know, there's something about them. And for me, it's Patty, and it's always been Patty in our gym. Everyone talks about, the guy and for me it's Paddy. Paddy's that guy, you know, he's just kind of he's a superstar. And anyone who trains with him, like you ask ask just ask Reese, reach out to Reese and say, What do you think of Paddy McCrory? And he'll tell you exactly, you know, what he thinks of Paddy McCrory. Like it's just he's just he's he's an animal. He's an animal and like, you know, I've always said that he could be a UFC champion. He really could. And now he's gone up the middle with and you know, he's walking about, he's like, what, six six three, six four? so fast 
just you know fair play James took that fight but James probably thinks he's going to walk through him you know being a former cage warriors champion very experienced very good himself and they probably think actually you know it's a good style matchup for them but I mean there's a reason why Pally's took that fight you know I so that's about fun. about as good of a preview as we can uh, we can ask for here, and we just won't even bother preview preview in this one. Um, yeah, like I, I'm very excited. It's it, the proof will be in the pudding, I suppose, for everyone else who, who hasn't seen Paddy, um, because you know it is just that unknown as of right now, yeah. and, and you know yeah. we know the pedigree of James Webb. But Jesus, whatever happens in the fight, he's got a massive set of balls in him for stepping up at two and zero and yeah. taking on a former champion. Uh, we, look, we've we've kept you for far too long, Joe. Um, I do want to ask. Look, we've gone back and forth, and and I try not to ask you about the retirement always because well, I, I don't want to push it. And he's trying his best show to get you to yeah. announce it on the show here. That's no, I'm not. I'm genuine. I'm genuinely not. Go on, go on. Say what you want to say, Joe. With a bone. Well, I didn't want to say anything clearly from my, the, you know, the first twenty minutes where you're trying to get yeah. me to say something. <laughs> ask you about it, like multiple times, and you're like, and you come on and say. I don't, I don't really want to like you know ask you these things. I'm I don't, oh, no, I, 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 <laughs> I do want to ask, but I don't want to push it. But yeah. you're saying the door, the door is still open. So what is it that is going to pull you back, or maybe you don't know? Is it a case of you've got there's a new champion now, George Hardwick? Is it the UFC? Like what? It sounds like from your own words that that the passion to train isn't there anymore. So what will bring you back to to make you want to train for an, another fight? I don't know. I, I actually, I, I don't know. I really, I really don't know. It wouldn't even be the UFC, because it, it, I, see, after the after the fight, I had this like because I wasn't training and I I, I felt like I was like I can't, I can't I don't want to go back to the gym. I just want to move like do other things and there was so I wasn't training and then there was a period where I was like, what happens if Brian Boyle like does a video call with me? I was like Joe, I've got like a short notice fight here. You're gonna be like you know in the UFC. I, I would have ha- I would have had to have said no because I just was so far out of training and that, like so I had a lot of anxiety actually about getting called up to the UFC about having to say no to that like I was thinking I'll oh, just say I have bad signal <laughs> I can't I can't, I can't answer the phone <laughs> you know <laughs> so like things like that I don't I, I don't know what would put me back I, I suppose I just don't want to I just don't want to put a rubber stamp on it um just yeah. at this stage you know that's fair uh, you can tell me to fuck off the next time I text <laughs> yeah. <that's what's laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really but you probably have done a few times <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough well, look Joe I really really appreciate the time uh, thanks for joining us today um, we won't I'll, I'll promise I'll stop uh, hounding you about what, what your current status is um, <laughs> but look you've got a lot going on and uh, it's great to see someone who's kind of just dictating how they approach their career um, whether it's fighting whether it's not fighting on their own terms um, you've got a lot as I said the commentating sure you're helping lads out in the gym maybe even if you're not sparring as much and things like that but uh appreciate you coming on and appreciate the honesty as always yeah it was good to be on thanks very much guys thanks very much joe for your time thanks a lot boys all right guys we'll move on to the siam warriors card which was in cork wheel i'm going to hand it over to you a couple of fights on that card a uh, kind of a hybrid card um muay thai mixed martial arts i think some grappling as well it was all going on down at siam warriors last weekend <laughs> Bit of a mad one going on there. Yeah, like, it was, to be honest, it was mainly a Muay Thai card. To be honest, the Thai fights were absolutely class. But, um, like, there wasn't too much of an emphasis on MMA, I guess. There was a lot of grappling bouts, so it was kind of a mix happening there on that card. But, uh, yeah, I think there was three amateur fights in the end. So, Roger Keller from MMA Cork beat Jordan Mullen in a heavyweight fight. Uh, unanimous decision there. There was a 91kg catchweight where Sam Driver from MMA Cork also beat... Uh, oh god I'm going to butcher this Monty Balassis oops uh, with a rear naked choke and then there was a 73 kg catchweight fight and another MMA Cork victory with Barry Kennedy beating Daniel Hamper uh, being a being unanimous decision but uh, to be honest you, that was mainly a Thai boxing show with a few MMA fights in a cage over in the corner from the looks of things to be honest but uh, to look, I'm not, there wasn't much really about it was there <laughs> That's it. That's it. No, not too much at all. Kind of went in and under the radar. I was curious to ask I did, you I about. I didn't see that. it to be honest with you. No, I didn't get the chance to watch <laughs> it. Watch the but not then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Andy, I know you were talking to Sean Denny, I believe, about uh, Martian Zembala's fight as well. Um, you know, he um, 
you know, he had some tricky moments, I think, in that fight. Can you kind of maybe break it down and, and, and kind of what Sean Denny said uh, to you about that fight? He was there live watching it. Go, we go to our, our Polish correspondent, Sean Denny. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mercy is about another win. Uh, so I think that's two on the trot now. You know, he was in a, a rough spot in his career and uh, he had that great head kick knockout not so long ago and, and another win by decision there today. Or sorry, not today. Uh, just, uh, yeah, his, his last fight just there. So, yeah. Uh, forward pressure good jab um attacking submissions um and yeah just a solid showing overall so um an, another win for Marcin and seems to be kind of steadying the ship um and i know he's got a, a fight coming up against roger lopez i believe in or um so that should be you know uh, another interesting one i think they tried making that fight before so um you know he, he's Indeed. on a on a bit of a run yeah nice to see him on a good run and and, and turning that record around as well um uh, Matisse Zahar- um, Zarahos. Zaharos. Zaharos. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, his fight got cancelled this weekend. He was supposed to be fighting over at Brave Andy. Any kind of what yeah, kind of story I, I, came out? I with still that? don't really know what exactly happened, but like I know he weighed in and it, it seemed to be good to go. But then Brave put out the, the statement that Brave put, or not statement, but the post that Brave put out was due to unexpected health issue, which has prevented him from entering the cage. Uh, Matisse Zaharos is forced to pull out. Um, and yeah, look, I, I, I kind of, I messaged Mahar of, uh, or Matisse, um, just to see was he all right, and he said, yeah, like he's, you know, he's, he's feeling okay, and he's trying to, trying to figure out what went wrong. So I don't really have any more details, um, on that. But uh, yeah, hopefully, I mean, hopefully his health is all right. Most of you know, when you see something like that, um, it's a bit odd because like when they've already weighed in, maybe it's, it's, did their body shut down? I, I don't yeah, know. So it's all just you could, no you point could in speculating. With, yeah, you could see sometimes like you know when they're trying to reload water their body might not react well or, or you know we have some incidents but like you yeah. said hopefully Matisse is uh, doing all right and we get to see him again soon on the same card we got to mention Brad Katona who went in there and pulled off a fantastic performance um picking up the brave uh bantamweight title not picking up defending it again um this Brad has been on a hell of a run since his uh, departure from the UFC um, joined up with Brave um, late, early last year, has since gone four and zero. You know, picking up a couple of unanimous decisions, a split decision, and a guillotine choke. Um, Magomedov, the guy who was in there with decent competition, very good fighter, but Brad had the answers for him. You know, looked good uh, in the grappling exchanges, looked strong with his jab, and um, had a nice little left hook that was landing all fight as well. So. Um, fair play to Brad Katona there. You know, going in there in Brave, you're not always going to get the most favorable matchups, really. And re- he came out on top on this one. And we have to start looking at maybe what's next, Quilcher, for him next, because one of the big three, quote unquote, the big three, maybe UFC, Bellator, PFL, you've got to be thinking that one of those uh, promotions are going to become calling for Brad f- fairly soon. Like, you'd imagine so. Um, let's see. There might be the other side of it of contract. So God knows what his contract is like with Brave, if there's a clause for him to leave, if he has to fulfill a certain amount of fights. Uh, I don't know these details, but just speculate that this, you know, there is, he is contract, probably most likely contractually, contractually obliged to fulfill a certain amount of fights or a contract with Brave. So it depends on that. And if they're happy to let him go to a promotion, I imagine UFC would be one that if they're willing to let him go, I think he'd be top notch to go there and i think they'd be quite they'd be chopping at the bit to get him as well because the run he's on is absolutely spectacular and i think he's probably earned a shot back in the ufc at this point let's be real 100 percent. if you're brad andy you're going to be chomping at the bit there to try and and you know it's probably his last ufc out and didn't go to plan for him i'm assuming that brad will be like chomping at the bit to try maybe go in there and prove that he can hang with guys in the ufc as well but i mean yeah the options of PFL and Bellator can't be snuffed at either as well. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like, there's definitely options out there. But it, it, if I was him, I, I'd probably want another. Like, I'd feel a little bit hard done by uh, with the initial UFC run. He won the Ultimate Fighter, and then like the only fighters he lost to was Marab Dvalishvili, who is like a title contender now essentially, and then Hunter Azur, who was undefeated at the time and and who's only lost in the UFC. I think was to Jack Shore, mm-hmm. um, and uh, so, so someone else who was like very highly ranked. Uh, was it? Brian or Brian Kelleher, so you know he's a solid fighter. So I, I don't know. I mean, especially you know four fight win streak. Now you'd like to see him maybe get another crack um, at the UFC. So why not? 
Absolutely. Couldn't agree more about that. Uh, over in my neck of the woods, Makinde Ademie won at BFL 74 against Brandon uh, Leberkirke via unanimous decision. He moves to 2 and 0 this year, 2 and 1 since moving uh, to Canada from Ireland. And um, yeah, there's another good win for McKinde. He fights on the same play at the same place, BFL, that's Battle Fight League. Uh, Dario Sinagoga, who also fights there as well, and uh, you know, picked up another good win. So, fair play to McKinde, worth the mention for sure. Um, Danny McCormack signed for Invicta FC since the last time we've been on. A fantastic signing for, for Invicta number one. And a fantastic move for Danny, it has to be said. She's going to be going in there on November 16th into the strawweight title as a tournament reserve. And she's going to be taking on uh, Fatima Klein in uh, her debut there. And like I said, this is a good opportunity for her, Quilcha. She's going in there as a strawweight tournament reserve. So if anything happens in any other fights, she could nip on in there and have a chance of claiming the strawweight title within maybe, you know, if things... If someone gets hurt or injured, I don't know what way the actual tournament format is, but you know, there's a real chance to kind of for Danny to get in there and and kind of go for that title from the get go. I was thinking that because I was unsure about how the tournament uh, tournament format even works, but uh, like as soon as I saw like reserve, I was thinking, geez, this is a uh, fairly it's a big deal because she could go from this two fight skid to winning a reserve matchup for this tournament. And then go on a run and all of a sudden be a champion like this could be huge and it could be a massive turnaround for Danny. So a uh, great move. I'm delighted to see Invicta signing more Irish fighters. That's two on the roster now. We've got Danny McCormick and we've got Shauna Ballon. So, you know, they can keep on signing them. <laughs> I think we've got Katie Saul as well. Is she signed to them? She could be. So uh, there's another one. You need Invicta card in Ireland at some point. You know that, lads? Yeah, that's it. We're, we're taking over slowly but surely. And uh, the more Irish fighters fighting in North America, the better for me anyway. At least, you know, Shauna's, Shauna's fight was on prime time and, and so will Danny's be on prime time for me. And uh, yeah, very exciting to see uh, talent from Ireland getting swept up by a couple of big promotions as well. But I'm sure you agree, Andy. Maybe I'll just give you a, a second just to kind of express your opinion on Danny signing with Invicta. Probably on the same alliance as us. Great move for both. Yeah. And uh, excited yeah. for the next stage in uh, Danny's uh, career path, I guess. Yeah, I think it's a good move. I mean, like, I, I never really understood what was going on with Danny in Bellator. Like, there was no path. There was no progression path. Um, and there was no division for her. So it's great to see her just, you know, having five fights available to her. She can, you know, be trying to push for a title um, with a few wins. Um, and, you know, selfishly, it sets up the real possibility of Danny McCormick versus Sean O'Bannon, which would be, uh, tell you what, like Invicta FC, bring a card over to Ireland for the crack. You've seen how Bellator do it. Uh, why not come over, stick, the, you know, give them a couple of fights each first. Maybe one of them gets to a title before the other and then have a, a title fight between them. If they if they can both rise to that challenge, That's uh, it. why not have a, a title fight between two Irish women in Dublin? The old classic saying is, if you build it, they will come. And there would be serious hype if that fight was ever to, to to go down, especially if it was for a title under the Invicta banner as well. But you know, but it's we're exciting. Getting, we're getting ahead of ourselves first. Yeah, way ahead you, of never you never know. You never know. There's so many, uh, so many things that could happen in between now and then. But it's great to see, like I said, Irish talent being signed up at Invicta. Another signing, uh, another big signing as well, which you broke the news of, uh, Andy, is Richie Smullen is back with Bellator mm. and it's great to see as well yeah brilliant um, I, I was surprised this to be honest because she was kind of really pursuing that UFC path um, obviously taking a lot of fights outside of of um, you know just just in kind of uh, regional shows around Europe and he became a double champion uh, in a show um, yeah I, I think it's a great move um, I think he can really I, I, I honestly think Richie Smullen is one of the better uh, 145ers in Ireland um, he, he could he could even put a claim to being the best 145er in Ireland uh, for all we know um, I think he's going to go in here and, and have a real impact in, in Bellator um, and I think that I, I believe that Bellator kind of try and work on you know getting him over onto US shows too which was a really positive thing to hear um, so like, I, I don't want to see I think Richie's in a point in his career where he's past the point where you know you're just kind of fighting twice a year and, and having fights for not for just having for the sake of fights but um 
I would really like to see him pushed against people, maybe not a ranked opponent immediately, but but stick him in there against ranked opponents, you know, very in quick succession. Um, let's say maybe maybe they stick him on the February show here in Dublin, and then stick him against a ranked opponent somewhere, whether it's whether it's in September in Dublin again or else on a show in the US. But um, interesting to see how how Richie gets on, and, and I'd I'd like to see him, you know, making a charge um, up the rankings. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to see him back in with Bellator. I thought it was. You know, he was very hard done by, I thought, being released the first time around. And, you know, it's a good opportunity. If if there's any fighters out there that are looking at what attitude you should bring to getting released by Bellator, look no further than Richie, who went over to RFP, went over to enemy territory and took on some tough competition over there and picked up three finishes and three fights mm. and picked up a couple of titles along the way too. And that's what you do. That's Richie Smullen all around. Get the head down, get the wins, and now he's back where he belongs at Bellator. And I'm looking forward to seeing how he gets on there in the featherweight division. There's definitely a couple of exciting matchups for him there. And also, if he gets the chance to fight stateside too, that would be brilliant to see as well. Um, but yeah, a great, great signing for him. Quilcha, I'm after announcing a youth championship, which is going down in December. What can you tell us about that? So it's IMAF instead of IMAF. It's so it's going to be done under the. Uh, it's going to be done under the IMAF banner. Um, so yeah, like IMAF after announcing the inaugural Irish International Open Youth Tournament, uh, which will go down on the on December eleventh in SBG HQ, from what I understand. So uh, essentially, what this is going to be is it's an open tournament where you can have teams fly in from different locations and compete because at the moment the youths only kind of have the world championships they don't have their continental ones just yet so the fact that something like this is put on gives them a bit more of an opportunity for experience you can get more international competition so you can get the likes of anyone really just fly over if they have the capability and is uh, this kind of like how the four nations tournament was on in england like is that, is that what they're kind of doing here Essentially, it's like Four Nations, just but for youths, and it's more, it's broader. So it won't be just Four Nations. It'll be, you name it, anyone. We could see mm. all sorts rock up, really. So, yeah, that's a nice little bit of news, kind of to help the, I guess they're focusing on growing the next generation of the youths and bringing them through. So it's nice to see something like that come, especially in the international tournament. Yeah, definitely is. That's very interesting, and uh, you know, more competition is always good, um, to see, um. You know, last thing, last but not least, is a guy we don't talk about all too much on this podcast, considering that we are an Irish <laughs> MMA podcast. But, you know, it's good to focus. He's got enough attention through the years. That's Conor McGregor, who's probably getting attention for the wrong reasons now and the fact that he's been out of the USADA pool now since his injury. Um, Dana White was asked last night about that. Um, he wasn't asked why he was removed and that's the information that's kind of lacking uh you know why he was removed or uh, why it's okay for him to remove himself from the rankings but basically dana was asked about it and he just said yep yeah, it's going to be six months back in the pool before he even competes again so we know at this stage uh at the release of this podcast that he's not going to be around for at least six months again but uh curious to what you think about that situation andy it's bizarre, isn't it? Like, I, it's just a lot of questions. Like, why, why are you not in the USADA testing pool? Um, it it also like it. I think we've kind of known for a while, but you know, there's a lot of like it'll pop up on social media and be like, you know, I'm coming back soon. It's like, well, you're you're definitely like it's, you're hundred percent not because you have to have six months in the pool. So it means number one, we're not going to see him fighting until probably next summer at the earliest um and even then you know when do we when does he re-enter the pool like is that going to be soon why i don't know i'd be i'd just be interested like maybe if someone can get an interview with him and ask him these things like rather than just the usual questions just like well wait why aren't you being tested um and like you know i'm this isn't i don't know what the answer is maybe there's a oh, perfectly legitimate reason we're asking uh, you know, we're just asking questions that everybody else is but i mean yeah, yeah. there has been no but clear like, answers yet you have people and fighters like that are kind of making uh, insinuations Speculate. about him yeah and like for a guy who is always very um outspoken against um you know people who've popped for peds and stuff and that, that this just because he's out of the rank or they're out of the pool doesn't mean that that he has or anything like that but um yeah it's just odd it's just odd i don't, I don't understand it yeah, it'll be interesting to see, you know, obviously, you know, it's going to come up again down the line. It'll be interesting to see what works out, but definitely worth to mention something that we're keeping an eye on and probably look at in reality something we probably should have brought up here a little bit sooner than we did. But, 
you know, it was a kind of a, a hot topic from from the press conference with Dana the other night, um, and it's worth mentioning. But we'll for sure keep an eye on that as well. Um, Charlie Ward is going in to take on Fabian Edwards on the 29th of October, guys. Um, you know, I just came off an interview last week with Kieran Davern, who spoke about the fight. Um, says Charlie never looked, has never looked better, is in good form, is loving his training, and um, there's going to be no excuses for Charlie. That's the words of Kieran Davern before this fight. Really fascinating fight here, Andy. Was- was that your biggest take? What like I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts. Have not spoken to Kieran? Like, what was your biggest takeaway about this fight from from that Kieran Davern interview? My biggest takeaway when I was speaking about Charlie's fight was just how happy and content Charlie is right now, or how he seems based off what Kieran said. His commitment to training, his commitment to getting better, and I think we've seen that commitment over the last couple of uh, fights that he's fought in as well. But generally speaking, I even noticed that Charlie was up cornering a cage conflict as well. So, you know, even Kieran said himself, it's hard for, for to get Charlie out to do a bit of training of his own accord. So it's great to see him like uh, up there and cornering other guys and giving advice. Mm. And Kieran was even saying to run in the car on the way up and Charlie was in the back and he was dipping the carrots into hummus and eating them himself and giving them <laughs> to the rest of the fighters. So just kind of really, uh, you know, encouraging and, and leading other fighters down the path. And that to me, my takeaway from that is that, you know, that's what you want a fighter to be doing, engrossed in it. You know, it's a difficult it's a difficult kind of situation to be in where you maybe don't enjoy fighting or don't enjoy training. And, uh, you know, I'd be interested to see what that's like for fighters because you don't enjoy training all the time and you don't enjoy fighting all the time. But it really seems that, you know, Charlie is on a trajectory now that has led him to this fight with Fabian Edwards. And this fight is the biggest fight of his career. And this fight with yeah. a win could see him get a title shot. And it's just great to see Charlie in that position, a guy who's been through the ups and downs of the sport. And he deserves this this position. And he deserves this fight. And it'll be very interesting. This one is a tough, tough fight for him. I'm not, I, I have to say it. There are routes to victory for Charlie in this fight. Um, you know, Kieran kind of alluded that to it in the interview as well. They know there's routes to it, you know, without giving anything any any details where do you think where do you think is it's it's um, it's the grappling it's the grappling to me i feel he's got to take fabian down and assert his dominance in the grappling here i feel that fabian edwards has too many tools on the feet for charlie charlie has some great power and i wouldn't be worried about him in the boxing range but i don't think fabian is going to fight him in boxing range i think fabian is going to look to try and pick him apart on the feet from the outside and i think it's going to be up to charlie to close that distance to take away fabian's kicking game and to get fabian down onto his back and do what charlie does best and we've seen that in previous fights and um, you know, I'm really excited to see if if Charlie can kind of can implement his game plan and get the win. I, I feel a win. You've got to be talking title shots next if if he gets a win. And Kieran is thinking the same, and Fabian's camp are going to be thinking exactly the same. It's really fascinating encounter, Andy, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think you spoke brilliantly there about it, and I I think I agree. I I really feel like Charlie's run with Bellator has really flown under the radar. Uh, and like we talked at, at length about this, about our excitement for this fight and how like how Charlie deserves it and how it's it's a fantastic fight that has been kind of long a long time coming. But I really I really do feel like Char- Charlie's run has, has been flying under the radar. Um, I I think that he was kind of unfairly, um, almost like made uh. I feel like people, people like not Irish people, but like on the internet, like or maybe American fans, kind of like joked about Charlie a little bit, but just because of his association with Connor, and then that that knockout uh, that he he suffered, um, the, the the kind of the weird knockout at um, I'm forgetting the lad's name, where he he, he threw him to the ground and Befando, yeah, good galore Befando, um, but like Charlie's a solid solid fighter, um, and he's really just come into his own in Bellator, and, and like he's no one's really talking about him in title contention which is kind of bizarre to me because if he wins this he should be fighting for a title Johnny Edlin called him out yeah. on the microphone after he won the title that, so he did so his oh, name is right I in the mix out, so. uh, yeah. <laughs> but if, I feel like maybe, maybe he is but I feel like you don't hear like media uh, talking about you know Charlie has the potential next whereas you'd be damn sure if Fabian sure. Edwards wins he'll be in the title fight absolutely absolutely yeah um, Quilch, I know you're excited for the fight too. We've all expressed our, our opinions. Um, anything to add to the conversation before we move on? 
Uh, you've summed it up pretty much everything that I would have said, to be honest, lads. Um, you robbed all your talking points. <laughs> I know, I'm fucking buzzed, lads. Jesus Christ. Um, how can you not be excited for it? Like, I think, like, it's just, it's one of those fights. I think, basically, I think if Charlie wins, he should get a title fight. Where, like, and it should be in Dublin in the main event. There we go. That's, 100%. That's all I have for it. 100% it'd be great to see him back in Dublin next year it'd be great to see Charlie on the outer angle we'd happily have him on any time for a conversation as well so hopefully we can make that happen somewhere down the line uh, moving on Ger Harris is going in there at CFS as well Quill should pretty soon taking on uh, Abdura Hackman Nazardinov uh, in a flyweight title there uh, it's good to see Ger back recover from the injury um, taking a, a little break from his excellent commentary at Cage Legacy to kind of get in there and throw a few high performance moves himself lad that commentary was absolutely golden god bless you Jer harris that was fantastic uh provided some high level entertainment right there um but yeah look this is a serious fight lads he's Jer's not taking easy fights for his career he's really he's gone into the deep well the deep end in terms of tough fights from the start like you know so uh this is another really highly rated guy i speak to a guy quite often who trains at all stars and he has nothing but very good things to say about this guy um do you know he's tipped as a one to watch in all stars he's tipped as a very good you know very good flyweight that could do big things so uh it's a tough one for jer and i think if he comes out of this with a win it's gonna look massive for him and he could open up some huge opportunities um especially given how kind of thin flyweight is in terms of like fights and what ones you can get. So yeah, I'm really excited for this one. I think it's going to be high paced from the very beginning, to be honest, and uh, an absolute barn burner. So not one not to be missed, lads. Absolutely. Speaking of barn burners, Andy, Cage Warrior 140, Cage Warriors 145, headlined by Paul Hughes and George Fusenich. Massive, massive fight in relation to Irish MMA. Uh, a rematch everyone has been waiting for and we're only a couple of weeks away from it now it truly is exciting let's talk about the first fight first because there's a lot of controversy Mm. around that and having watched that fight back um i would lean towards paul hughes relatively easily without any question winning that fight at either 29 28 or you know my personally Honestly, and I try not to look at things with a, with a biased view, but I had that fight scored almost 30-27 for Paul Hughes in two very close rounds, that being said. Um, coming in here, I mean, obviously we spoke, spoke to Joe McColgan about it as well. Uh, what are your thoughts heading in to this fight? How do you see it going down uh, in the rematch? Yeah, um, I'm very, very excited for this fight. I think it's as high level of fight as you'll see on the regional scene. Um, I agree with you. I I had it scored for for Paul Hughes. Uh, I watched it back again today, and I, you know, I wasn't. I was kind of just had it on. I wasn't looking. It was uh, round one to Paul Hughes and round three to Paul Hughes as well. So. Uh, 29 28 for me Hughes um this is a fucking savage fight uh, like the the two of them have improved vastly they're two incredibly diverse and well-rounded mixed martial artists um they're comfortable whether it's uh, offensive wrestling whether it's counter wrestling we saw the switches Paul was hitting we saw the switches that uh which Jordan Vucenic was hitting we saw the, how they are in the clinch how they are uh fighting a, a kickboxing range a boxing range they can both bang uh they both have gas tanks we've seen them go in there in subsequent fights against the likes of Morgan Sherrier and have five round wars uh, and come through them we've seen um Jordan Vucenic uh, overcome um, other fighters I'm forgetting his name James Hendon uh, in his last fight and, and finish him um, I think they've both improved quite significantly since their first fights first fight um, and the fact that this is over five rounds now adds a nice another little wrinkle to it this is a trial for the UFC for both of them um, I really believe that I really think that the winner will get picked up by the UFC we don't always see Cage Warriors champions get picked up by the UFC immediately these days, but I do think that this time uh, the winner will will advance. Um, and I just think it's an absolute cracker of a fight. I think that it's it's a fantastic event from an Irish perspective because we've got so many fighters in the card, and I just wish it was in Ireland or I wish it, this should be in Belfast or somewhere. Uh, I would love for love for it to be on Irish soil, but Jordan Vucenic, 
uh, fairly, whatever we think about the first fight, as it stands, he is the, the rightful champion. Um, so this is a unification rematch, um, and I can't wait. Just a fantastic over car, uh, over, overall card at Cage Warriors 145. Like you said, Andy, steeped with Irish talent as well. It is a pity, and I think they're missing a step here not having this card in Ireland as well, but that's a, a conversation for another day. Um, you could on the card, we've got Adam Shelley, we've got Ryan Shelley, we've got Decky McAleenan, we've got Caelan Loughran. Um, actually, uh, Decky McAleenan takes on Andre Conclaves. Um, in the lightweight division, great to see Decky back. We've got uh, Ryan Shelley coming in against Josh Reed. That's a super fight in the featherweight division. That's like insane. Banger. Crazy insane. horse is never in a bad fight. Ever. Insane. Um, we've got his brother Adam who's coming in against El Haji and Daya. Uh, another great fight too in the lightweight division. Quilch, you talk to me about Caelan Lochran versus Luke Shanks because this to me is an absolute belter of a fight one that i can't wait to i'm really excited to see kaylin every time he gets in there obviously he's been on and and uh, is an active listener of the owl triangle he's been on with us before it's always exciting to see caleb get or kaylin getting in there getting some good competition here he's facing luke shanks his toughest test to date here really isn't it it is yeah and like jesus i've been uh He's some man to chat shy, is that Loughran, isn't he? Jesus Christ. I look at his Twitter every weekend and I think he, I get some laugh out of him. But you know what? He always backs it up. Um, and that's what he's done. You know, he's done it every time now. So this is probably, as you said, it is the biggest fight. So if he can back it up once again, I think it's title shot. Kind of has to be, in my opinion, anyway, because like it's a huge, it's a huge name, a former champ. Get him out of there and well, look, there you go. Uh you do what you've been telling us you're going to do all along. And I'm really excited to see that because he's been looking fantastic. He's gone, le- he's been leveling up every time we've seen him in there now, especially in that last one. So, uh, very excited to see this one. I think it'd be very good and a big fight for him. Big opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's a step up in competition, a step up in the right at the right time for me, Andy is, uh, as well for Kalen as well, coming in against the former, former title, uh, winner, champion I guess and, and contender as well at the flyweight division Luke is coming up to Bantamweight um, he's fought there once or twice before already but it's a big opportunity for Luke as well coming in here but stylistically this is a fantastic matchup yeah it's a, it's a great fight I mean just look at uh, Luke Shanks fight against um, uh, why, why do I always say I always blank on names Sam Creasy um, he, he finished him like I know he missed weight but he finished him so, so like in theory he has a claim to he doesn't but he but at the same time he does have a claim to to the fl- the flyweight t- hashtag title MMA match. <laughs> yeah now now uh, Caelan Lochran will turn around and tell you yeah well I'll tower over him and he's he's only tiny and all this stuff but Luke Shanks is a is a seriously good fighter uh, Shanks is someone who you, you know you you wouldn't be out of place talking about him as one of the guys who could progress up to the UFC uh, as you know one of the next guys from Cage Warriors uh, obviously he needs to get his, his weight uh, in order when it comes to making weight but uh, this is a huge opportunity uh, for for uh, Caelan Lochran and I think that if you can if you can overcome this challenge um, then I think we're talking title contention next Indeed, obviously you know we talked to um, Joe McCulligan Andy about uh, Paddy McCurry who was stepping in against James Webb at short notice fair play to both guys for taking this I mean Paddy coming in against his most experienced opponent and James Wedd, former middleweight champion in cage warriors. And, you know, we have to give some credit to James Webb as well, who's, you know, taking a chance on his own career as well and giving the chance to Paddy coming in 2-0 and in his career. Um, this is a fantastic fight. I'm excited to see Paddy getting in there. It's going to be a real, real good battle. And I'm excited to see how it goes down. But, uh, you know, you got first win of that as well and kind of broke the news on that as well. Yeah, the excitement must have been real when that kind of came across your your your. Uh, I couldn't history. believe it. Like I'm, I'll, I'll say my piece, and then I want to get, I want to, I want to know what your both of your initial reactions were, because I couldn't believe this. Like when when I I it got sent to me, I was like, this, what, sorry, what? Because I saw Paddy had, had put up, he was fighting a former champion, and then I started, my brain starts ticking over, and I'm like, well, who could this be? And I'm like, it, it surely can't be James Webb. Like he already has a fight booked, and there's no way they've they've matched those together right now, but. Paddy McCarry's got a set of balls in him. That's what I just keep saying. That's the only thing that keeps coming up in my mind. He's got a set of balls in him to come in and take this in his, his third fight. Um, I know James Webb has suffered two, I think, back-to-back uh, finishes, uh, losses, 
but he's still a former champion uh, and we've seen him in those wars with Natias Frederick we know what James like James is a gritty gritty fighter uh, he can fight on the feet look he's not he's not the most incredible striker you'll ever see but he can he can bang on the feet and he's a very very persistent uh, pressure heavy relentless grappler um so it's a tough matchup, but my God, if Paddy McCarry can come in here and beat James Webb, that is such a statement in your in your Cage Warriors debut. Like to, <laughs> that is bananas. It, is. it really it is, is bananas. I mean, you know, I I speak about it maybe to a larger scale with some fighters in in taking chances on themselves, and you know, it's you have to kind of make sure that you're being matched up correctly, but. Every now and again, there's no harm in taking an old chance. And obviously, the fighters are going to be taking fights with the belief that they are going to win it. And that's why Paddy has chosen to come in here and take on James Webb, obviously, because he believes he can get the job done. But he's taking a big chance, as is James Webb taking a big chance, taking a really promising fighter as well. So I just love seeing fighters doing that, taking chances, um, you know, challenging themselves against top level competition. And I, I'm sure Creelshire agrees this is like a high level matchup and a really interesting fight um that's basically just fell on our laps this week so we don't have to wait too long for it to happen either i genuinely thought you're chatting shit when you announced that fight to be honest <laughs> um couldn't believe it in all honesty so uh yeah like my initial thoughts were that and ever since i've been in disbelief so huge opportunity for paddy fair play to james because like you know what i'd say he just wanted to fight at the same time and just to get a Gonna get get back on track. He didn't win his last one, did he? I can't remember my. Oh, no, he's coming off two stoppage two, losses. Two stoppage, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he's trying to get back on track again. So, um, massive opportunity and massive fight. And you know, I'd love to see how many FAI versus Team KF fights have we had this year, lads. Jeez, we need to get a tally on this. <laughs> yeah, quite yeah. I feel like they're always they're always going back and forth, aren't they? Yeah, quite the right that, yeah. Indeed. Um, from one James to another James. And that's Jimbo Slice, who's also on the card as he takes on, um, as he takes on, oh, my, the name is escaping me now. Jamie, Jamie Richardson. Richardson. Jamie Richardson. Former Excuse title me. contender, Jamie Richardson. Former title contender. I had it at the tip of my tongue. And your forgetting name is contagious, forgetting names is contagious, apparently. Um, yeah. But look, at, we had the chance to speak to James uh, before that fight, uh, about that fight. And about a couple of other things as well. So I'm going to throw it over to Quilch to take that interview away. And now we're joined by the man with one of the best nicknames in Irish MMA, James Jimbo Slice Sheehan. How are you getting on today? <laughs> I'm getting on great. M- M- Mr. Slice. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting on great. <laughs> I must admit, that is one of the funniest stories I've heard in terms of getting stitched up with a fight with a nickname before a fight. Oh, it's it's brilliant. And then I don't know, I stuck up an Instagram thing as well. Uh, after I got given that nickname, I've like obviously uh, Graham is my younger brother, and Reds came up with uh, Graham Bread instead of Game Bread. So like I thought, like, man, that is brilliant <laughs> as well. Like you have to go with that. So like, fair play to Reds. Like he he he's good for a few things, useless for a few, and then he he pulls out some belters. Does Matthew have one as well, or what's going on? Does he get a nickname? Uh, nah, Matthew's retired. Don't don't even talk about that, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get into it. So, uh, look, you have a fight coming up at uh, Cage uh, Cage Warriors against Jamie Richardson. Uh, it's a big fight, massive one for you. How are you feeling ahead of it? What's kind of how's the body feel beforehand? How you feel going into it? Absolutely great. Like, um, I feel still reaping the benefits of just being injury free being like just going from fight camp taking obviously the the three four weeks off to kind of like relax a bit and then going straight into another fight camp like you're you're never really out of shape and it's great when you're never out of shape that you can work new things you don't have to worry about that kind of aspect so um it was just great to just keep on adding things to arsenal and i think this Honestly, this this fight really excites me, like because um, Jamie's a top top guy, and it's an interesting like puzzle to kind of like discover and figure out because um, he's obviously very good at some things, but then I feel I can capitalize on what he's good at, um, uh, with my strengths obviously, and I think it's going to be very interesting. Like I'm really actually excited to get in and compete. So, 
when you look at that matchup, where do you think your strengths are? I know you said you think you can outdo his strengths, but where do you think your strengths lie in this fight and where you can actually win it? I think like I don't I don't have to use my wrestling to beat him. Um but I notice in all of his fights that he, he will get taken down. Um he, he has good jujitsu, but I just feel like he's there to be um wrestled with and just there's a few things like I'm not gonna go too in depth like giving giving out like my entire game plan but like even on the feet like me uh, working with Neil we've just seen a few things that he, he tends to do like he's a seriously experienced guy and he's top top level opponent but there's there's a few things to capitalize on so not alone on the ground it's also on the feet that I feel uh, I can capitalize on a few things as well so you're saying there you're doing a bit with Neil Siri, so like he seems like a right character from whatever I've seen on Twitter from him but uh what's it like working with him in the gym and I know he's got all that experience especially in the striking as well like what how does he help and what in your game in general I just think he he does the basics so well and he's just a, a technician like he'll he'll break in such small little things he'll just tell you and like you'd never even notice them right and then once he says you're like oh yeah why, why am i doing that and then like once he points it out to you he'll just like even if we're hitting pads you'll just go like oh uh just turn your foot a small bit more because uh, you're squaring up like it, just small things like that and i could do one session with him and there's 10 things that he's given me and that just makes you when you get to this level, it's those little, little things that make the difference. And as you can see from my last last few um, performances, like they're, they're what, um, those little things are what make the difference. So I'm, I'm delighted with that. And then it's the same with Andy as well. Like I, I don't want to harp on, a, a, on just Neil. Like Andy is an absolute technician as well. Like even... Like people think Andy's just grappling. Like it's how Andy teaches us to uh, evolve the grappling into it to use our striking, and it's it's just phenomenal. I I'm I'm just really happy with the level of training I'm getting and how I'm I'm improving, and I I hope to show that off once again. I guess throughout kind of your Cage Warriors run, like you're on this incredible run at the moment, and I imagine there's eyes in the be- in the belt if you get a win at. at- against Jamie Richardson but like if we're going back to I guess when you first sent your cage warriors and you fought against um Ian Gary like yeah. two prospects coming up against each other very early do you think that fight happened a little bit too early almost or did you learn quite a lot from that especially now um, seeing how he's gone on to I suppose like if you're looking from the outside you could say like it probably happened a bit early because you could have sold it as a as a big fight like later down the road like if they wanted to do like an Ireland show you could have like me and Ian Gary who's the the best welterweight out of Dublin or whatever um and then like the winner of that could then go on to the title or so on and so forth but um I and initially I I was obviously sickened with the results of that fight um I just wasn't happy with the performance I wasn't happy even going into the the cage just wasn't happy with my preparation, anything. But from that, um, I learned so much. Like uh, even 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 when you've done a bad weight cut, it's terrible for that fight. But then it nearly benefits you in the long run because like the last few weight cuts, when you actually do it correctly, you're like, man, this can't be this easy. Like I it. it like when you do a bad one, it just seems like oh, it's meant to be this hard. And then when it's done right, you're like, oh, Jesus Christ! No wonder people perform so much better than I did, or whatever. Like I have so much more energy for training, and in the fight, I'm I'm, I'm peaking correctly. And I think that fight also taught me um, one thing that like I I don't mind being in like a a, a war, should you say, and it kind of taught me the importance of look you can you can be as tough as you want in this sport but unless you're an actual better fighter with better skills you're not going to win and that was shown on that night like Ian 
not that I think he's tough for them. He was just a better fighter on that night, and he showed he, he stayed on the outside. He played the smart fight. He didn't have to go into a dog fight with me. He just stayed on the outside, pieced me up, and won. And that's that's a few things that I took from that fight. Looking ahead now, I think I said there about the James Richardson one. Do you think this is one that if you get if you get a win here, that the title should be in the picture? Is it something you'd be calling for even, or do you think there might be one or two more fights before that? Um, I don't know. I feel like I feel like the welterweight uh, division is like constantly changing. Like the like so many like new names are coming in that are high level. So like I would have thought before like even your man the Italian for the Perasoli came in, and he he's fairly high level. And then Wallhead came back, and then even um what's his name Daniel Skibinski, and then Matthew Bonner dropped down, but then he's gone back up. So I feel like it's it's constantly changing. So it's hard to get a grasp on where I actually feel I am in the division. But certainly, if I defeat him. Um, Jamie, um, it would put me in like at least top five, and then possibly one more fight early next year, and then I would expect to to be in title contention. At, at least then, unless so, something changes again. But yeah, are you happy with your progression so far, James? Within Cage Warriors, like still only twenty six, still plenty of time left in your career as well. Are you in a rush to get to that title shot? Or are you happy to just go and take your fights, take your fights, and let it kind of naturally happen as you stay winning and winning? Um, I wouldn't say I'm in a rush. Uh, I think I've kind of learned from seeing other fighters as well that there's this rush to get to the UFC, and people think like, "Oh yeah, I've made it to the UFC," and like that's that's it. Then and, like. That's only one part of the journey. Like w- once you get to the UFC, you have to win there because like the UFC is is a ruthless organization. It's you're you're just a name. Like there's no like even like if you see Reese Reese stepped in against um, Hamzat on what like a week's notice or something. Fair enough, he's doing them uh, a favor stepping in, but like realistically, they they don't really care about you unless you're making serious money for them. So. I, I, I'm not in a rush to get to UFC. I'm just I just want to continue to progress, and when, whenever I think I'm I'm ready, I I, I know you you kind of know yourself, and like even like that, like Paddy Paddy Pimler kind of took his time getting to UFC, and it's paid off. And then a few other fights, like even Reds are Reds are kind of took um, a late late notice fight not on his terms as well and like it didn't really pay off for him either so there's a there's a few things that are in the back of my mind that am i back yeah you're back we just yeah, lost yeah. you there for a second we just just as you said there was a few things in your mind um, yeah, so I was just saying, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm in a rush. I, I just think if I keep on getting um, continuous fights each year, keep on stepping up in level of competition and beating them, then I'll naturally just get to the UFC and by that time I should be um, more than ready. Indeed, uh, it's a good way of looking at it because, you know, I think the path to the UFC is a lot easier to get to now. I think the key is getting there and staying there. Like kind of, that's kind of what you're alluding to. Um, whenever yeah, that yeah. call does come along, yeah, like it is. I think the main thing is that like this this is a a journey and and a career. If if you want it as a career, it can't just be this short thing that like oh quick 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 rush to the UFC and like maybe maybe get a win or two and then like you you want to. Like even even Ian, like Ian, Ian's progressing in the UFC, but like he's not taking giant leaps in the division or anything. Like he's he's going up steadily. He realizes that he's still young, and um, he's just progressing slowly. And I think that's that's the way to do it. Like, hundred yeah. percent, James. I read an interview earlier. Uh, it was from, geez, I think it must have been about a few years back now. It was actually with uh, it was with Matthew. 
and he talks about how how he got into the sport and he says in the interviews like oh so you uh he joined the Kokoro the martial arts or something and he went home raving about it and then you joined up soon after was that like was it always a collateral effect between all three of you where one starts enjoying it the other joins and then the other joins on top um i think so initially matthew went uh to coco and he came back and he was i remember he just kept on doing arm bars to me in like our kitchen and it was so fucking annoying. And I remember, I, like, nonstop, he was just, like, t- basically torturing me. And I'd say that was in the back of my head. And then, like, I got into MMA because one of my friends got into, like, a schoolyard fight and wanted to learn how to fight. And then, like, at the time, I just quit hurling. So I was like, oh, I'm, I'm doing nothing. I'll go. And my brother's there. So... That's another incentive that I can learn how to stop iron bars. So I definitely think Matthew initiated the thought in the back of my head. And it was the same for Graham as well. Like Graham um, played hurling and then me and Matthew went over to the World Championships in 2016. And Graham went and watched that. And once he saw Matthew winning the gold belt and kind of like me competing at it, um, I, I suppose he was influenced then as well and came back and started MMA and then we just we just bounced off each other like training and um, competing against each other and uh, I, I don't want to give Matthew too much credit because he has a he has a big head but uh, I definitely think Matthew did influence us a small bit yeah. But when did the uh, when did the move to Team Rhino happen then? Um. So. I'm trying to think. So Matthew moved to uh, Galway with the army, and I was still training in Coco and still fighting out of Coco. Um, and I think Coco started to lose a lot of fighters. So like Dylan, I, I used to train with Dylan Tuke, and then uh, Sean Kyogen was another name, and then um, like J.R. Campos and so on and so forth. And we we started to lose a lot of fighters, and like the the, the training wasn't to the same level, so like uh, it just kind of got hard to continue to train when like, there was only two bodies. So Matthew just came back from Galway, and I was obviously informing him of the level in Coco, and he was like, oh, "I don't want to go back to that." So he had a friend up in Team Rhino, so he started going up to Team Rhino, and. Basically, he was just telling me of the level, like like Reza was, um, I think he was still in the UFC. Then Neil was in the UFC, like the, all the guys were, like there was a great buzz around the gym. So I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. So he influenced me to make the jump then to Team Ryan. And then once I went up there, kind of just it showed me the, the, the difference in levels of like coaching and sparring partners and just like, dedication and competition so I uh, hooked immediately so the rest is history from then um, being at Team Rhino ever since James uh, anytime I kind of speak to Reza these days and I kind of refer to him as a coach he really rejects it immediately Um, and I feel like Rhino is typically the kind of place where people don't really take compliments because they're probably worried about what's coming behind it. Um, but for the likes of Reds, you talked about Siri there, but Reds are also, you know, how much of a, of a coaching input is he having these days in the gym? Reds are, is kind of taken on as the new, like, uh, no e coach. And to be honest, I think it's amazing because, because like, if you get, like, a straight jits guy, there's a few positions that, like, you just don't want to be, like, in bottom half in jiu-jitsu is fine, but, like, in MMA, like, you saw, like, you see Khabib, like, top top half guard is, like, a golden position to land ground and pound, so it's great having Reds are, like, he understands the unbelievable jiu-jitsu technique, but also, like, jiu-jitsu technique that transitions very well to MMA, so that's great. And the fact that he's he's still like young and like in phenomenal shape, he's a coach that can show the more intricate moves um himself and then like jump in and like show you and then like drill it hard or drill it in the round against you and 
like show you that like oh yeah this is how I did this and blah blah and so on and so forth so I do have to give Reza props he's, he's a great great teacher and a great training partner still and who who is the best uh, banter in the gym these days because there's, there's feeling like it's constant slagging uh, I don't know Reds are I, w- I will say this thing right Reds are talks the most amount of shit it, and it always happens when he's not training. So anytime he has a little niggle, he's, he'll, <laughs> he'll always be on the side of the mat, right? Talking the most amount of shit. And that's that's the most frustrating. That you're like, come on, come on the mat then. Come on, do something about it. And he's like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah go, go on, go on. Like, next week, you're not, you're not on my level. Never so, and as well, if you beat it, you'll hear about it for forever. Yeah, I think some yeah. of your work with Reds are really showed in, in your fight with Martin Cause, your last fight, James. You know, some good ground and pound landed in the finishing sequence. But overall, how were you happy with that part level of performance from yourself? I know that we spoke before that fight and, you you know, you were looking forward to getting in there, showcasing your skills against a decent striker. How What was your overall assessment on that fight and your performance on that fight? Um, I think initially I wasn't that happy with um, But the more I actually think about it, um and like was talking to the lads after um what i did i did well um i i moved my feet a lot um which i wanted to do i i thought he was going to come out a lot faster so that made me a small bit hesitant at the start of the fight um i stayed stayed super calm and composed which i was happy with and I'm happy that I took the took the um, the takedown and the finish when I was there. Like I, I suppose I, I, I did want to get a big stoppage um, in in Belfast. I'm, I felt I could have actually sat down on the punch a bit more and probably got like a first round KO as he was coming in at the end of the first. But I suppose you in this game you, you have to take as well what's what's given to you and what's there and to be honest at the end of the first one I took him down I felt I had a big advantage of him over on the ground so like why play with fire so yeah, yeah. and you, you you kind of did manage to take him down going to take his back into half guard I have to talk to you about the finishing sequence, James. I'm very curious about what I've seen and wonder if you can clarify for me. It looked to me, watching back the replay, that you secured your position into mount. You gave him a little kiss on the back of the head and then you proceeded to uh, ground and pound him <laughs> until the ref stepped in. What? <laughs> Did I see that correctly or what was going on there? <laughs> look, look. All right, I, I, uh, the French have a special place in my heart, all right? So I just wanted to... I just want to say, look, sorry, sorry. <laughs> gave him a little kiss, and then, and then, after I gave him the kiss on the back of the head, I remember what uh, Thierry Henry did to us in that one. <laughs> Hilarious. And that, that's what changed it for me. So. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> you gave him the little kiss of death before you finished him off there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was, was that just like an, an a spur of the moment? Like, I'm just going to give him a peck on the on the school here. Or, that, uh, you know, I, I'm just going along. I, did I actually do that? Or... Just, I, no, you did. You kissed him on the, on the back of the head as you were raining down shots. Him. Ian, Ian started today and sent it to us. And I was like, hang on, I haven't seen this before, but you 100% kissed him <laughs> as you're beating the shit out of him. Yeah, you can just see me just... Saying to myself, well, I'm like, nah, no homo, bro. <laughs> and then going in. <laughs> yeah, I thought uh, that was hilarious. I thought I was seeing things. I had to send it to the lads to confirm. I said, I have to ask you that. Yeah, send, send it to me, please. I will, I will. I'll send I'm going to make you. sure that I report every single video that has that in it. And that's getting taken down. That's, that's <laughs> you have to fight pass. <laughs> it, could become a, it could become a new fight trademark for you when you know you're about to get the finish, the little kiss of death, and then oh, you go. Man, I, I, I'd be very, very worried about that because then if, if that becomes your trademark and someone does it to you and you know it's coming as well, it's like, wait, man, was that a kiss on the back of my neck? Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. It's like when lads try to stalk and slap Nate Diaz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, like, Brilliant, brilliant yeah. stuff, brilliant stuff. Well, 
Unless, uh, Quil, should you have I, anything else? I have, I have one more. James, where, how do you see the £170 kind of title picture playing out over the next one? Obviously, Reese is champion, but there, there is a, a fight between uh, Matthias Figlak and Jimmy Wallhead coming up. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Um, so, it was meant to be that the, there's a New Year's Eve uh, card, I believe. So, I think it was meant to be that whoever wins the interim title will then fight Reese for that in on New Year's Eve. But like, I I know Reese. Um, did he dislocate his shoulder or break his break his collarbone or something? So like, I don't know if he'll be ready for that. But if not, um, uh, like if he's not ready, does it just turn into like whoever wins the interim belt? Then fights uh, the winner of me and Jamie maybe on New Year's Eve or something. I, I don't really know to be honest. Like it, it all depends on like how how quickly Reese is fit. Um, and I, I'd imagine if Reese defends his belt, he'd, he'd more than likely be going to the UFC then, and then there's nearly a new title shot all over again. Yeah, like do you like do you feel like a win here should put you in title contention position, or else one away? You know, I mean, may, may, maybe logistically, I, if if Reese is back, then maybe yeah, it is I, one I, more. I I, I I would imagine it would be one more because if Reese is the champion, then the interim belt is nearly like number one contender spot. Then I would be after the number one contender spot. Then that that that's how I'd probably see it. So like. Probably I would, like you could do it that like I would face the the loser then of the title shot and then fight for the title. I, I I'm not really sure, lads. To be honest. Not fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going off to watch the F1 there now this afternoon, James? I know you were talking about it. Uh, to me, I was only I was only going to ask you as well. I was only going to ask you about the F1. Yeah, know, it, it, the US it, one is not that exciting it. this year. No, no, it's not. There's a lot of cheating accusations and stuff going around with the Red Bull team now and everything as well. They're getting all kinds oh, of grief. Yeah? Ah, sure. Look, you know, it's tough at the top, as you know yourself. McLaren and uh, and Red Bull are always uh, going at it, looking for any excuse to kind of get points taken off them, etc. Yeah. But yeah. you're a fan. Is that outside of outside of fighting, James? You know, you, you're a fan of F1. Is what else do you like to do to kind of unwind and uh, uh, kind of get your mind off of fighting? Um, it's gas. Like the lads, the lads in the gym always call like me and Graham hippies. Like, just because like we have like a slack line and like it, like a like an old like coffee spot. And <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember like uh, before Belfast, uh, the lads were like, we're just looking to get a bit of food before heading to the venue. And I remember like I just looked up like best. I don't know, cafe in Belfast. I went to this real, real hipster spot, and the lads just walked in. He was like, "Why are you on, pal?" Like, <laughs> the 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 girl has a big nose ring, purple hair, and and just reds are there. I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, nice, nice, man. We got a, we got black pudding and all like this to us." Any cuddle by the table of us and everything. <laughs> But I will say, hipsters, hipsters have very good coffee. That's the one thing I will say. Are you, are you slacklining like at a, a low level or a high level or, or what? Nah, like I'm only doing it like between like two trees and everything. <laughs> like if, if you fall off, you're grand. Like I'm not dead if I fall off. I'm not doing it between mountains <laughs> like the high level dudes. But um, yeah, like I might do that like once a year or something. Get into the ocean a bit and... Go for an old coffee, watch a bit of F one, bit of bit of hurling, that's about it. Like How how dare you enjoy your life? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how dare I not like because like I'm I'm not a I'm not a big drinker. I'm not a I'm not big for like partying and anything, so like that's that's literally just what I do. Like after the after the fights I mean like uh paddy the fatty. Uh just love a bit of food and then Bit of slack and a bit of chilling out and then training. 
Lovely. We can expect you on there now and embracing your hipster lifestyle with some dreadlocks the next time we're talking to you then or something. Uh, yeah, man, you need to be careful. Once I, once I retire from MA, I'll probably grow out some dreadlocks, open up one of those coffee trucks or some bollocks, something like that. <laughs> be, be one of them annoying dudes that everyone hates. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. James, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we've kept you for a fair bit of time now. We look forward to seeing you in action against Jamie Richardson at Cage Warriors 145. Wish you all the best. Imagine it's going to be an absolute scrap as always. They're always must-watch action. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the cage. Thanks so much, lads. Appreciate being on. Don't be kissing anyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I must send you on that video, James. I, I, I'll, I'll yeah, try and snap do, that. and then I'm going to report it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually on your own Instagram to make it worse. Oh yeah, uh, that shadow ban me then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, James. Nice one, James. Cheers. Thanks, lads. Great stuff, as always, from James. Um, always a pleasure to have him on. As we move on to the Q and A section of the podcast, and we'll rattle through this really quickly as we are getting a little bit tight for time. Um. Ben Harding asks if the UFC came to Dublin for a pay-per-view or fight night, who would be on the card? And he wants one of us to make up a card. So if you were to mock up a card there, Quill, I'll show it over to you. What would you do? I, I couldn't give you opponents, but I could give you a few Irish fighters that'd be on the card, maybe. Um, oh, okay. Paul Hughes would be on it. I'd love to see that. Gunnar Nelson, straight up. Mm. Um, potentially, depending on what it is, Sean O'Bannon, um, Lee Hammond, do who else? Jeez, lads, I'm gonna start missing a few here and there now. If you would have one main event, what do you, what would you pick it as? Oh, and Jesus. think realistically too. It's it, it's going know, to have to be it's going to have to be Ian Gary to be honest, really, isn't it? It would, yeah. But does he want to fight in Ireland? Maybe headline offer, actually headline offer, Dublin. Offering, yeah, uh, he's been fairly vocal. He's and he's he, after his last fights, he's been vocal, and, and I think the opportunity to headline and sell out the Tree Arena in Dublin under the UFC banner is one that not a lot of people would turn down. Really, what do you think, Andy? Well, I was going to say Paddy Pimler versus Conor McGregor. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I never want to do that, lad. Never say, go to Andy that. next next first next time. So I'm living a dreamland. So maybe just skip me. <laughs> oh yeah, well, that would be the dream. But geez, I don't think that that's going to happen. Like, sake, you're, you're likely, <laughs> when the UFC eventually does come over, and it's going to happen eventually, it's probably not going to be an Irish fighter headline, really. Yeah, it could, might not ah. even be like at, at anyone. You're 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 going to have to probably throw Ian Gary into a co-main event at the very least, just to kind of keep that Irish interest. I wouldn't turn my nose up at a non-Irish kind of main event. Do you, know, do you know what we might get? You might get a Molly McCann main event. Yeah, I'd perhaps. love it. Perhaps. Absolutely yeah. love it. That wouldn't, be, that, would, that wouldn't be the worst call at all, to be honest. That wouldn't be the worst call at all. But if you're going to have Molly McCann there, why would, would you put someone like, I'd be thinking of a matchup for Ian Gary versus Donald Cerrone or someone like that as the main Ooh. event. Do you know what I mean? Ooh. Just kind of put a big name marquee name beside Ian Gary a veteran of the sport yeah you need you need someone that. to kind of to prop it up and yeah yeah for sure yeah. but um, look at you stick Irish talent on a card any card and put it in the tree arena people are going to turn up people are going to get excited about it but you know it's great to have a couple of names to throw around there and, and kind of mess around with that maybe we'll have a little unfortunately Ben I think we're we need to start screaming for them to actually get over to Ireland because yeah. uh, I don't think there's any sign of it anytime soon yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, Ross asks, albeit Peter Lavery had a mayor at cage conflict and was banning him the right move and it does a set the precedent going forward. We kind of spoke a little bit about this already, Quilcher. Maybe I get your thoughts on this um, uh, and, and Ross's question. Yeah, like I guess we spoke about that earlier, but I, it's cage cat. It's- it's cage conflicts decision who they bring in, who they don't, and when something like that's ha- something like that happens, you know, if you, you know, there is mistakes. If you make a mistake in your job, you won't always get fired. But if you make a mistake that could cost someone massive, like could have a serious impact on someone's life, then there's a very good chance you get fired. So uh, it's a ruthless business. At the same time, I'm not surprised it happened and was set a precedent. I don't think so. If mistakes like that happen, I guess there is expected. But at the end of the day, look. So I, I don't really know enough about all this. And at the same time, I'm just giving my opinion here. But what we do need is just recognition for this to for there to be kind of a 
I don't know, for there to be a solid answer to everything, that's what we really need is recognition. So maybe these things probably wouldn't happen then. But I'm not too sure, lads. 100%. 100%. Um, Andy Ross also asks on that topic, topic he want, uh, a fighter wanted an apology. Again, not defending the ref, but have we ever seen a ref apologize on the record in Irish MMA? Or in MMA in general, really? I have really a clue. Happen. Yeah. I don't, think, I it, I, clue I, I don't think it generally happens at, at all, to be honest. Um, with refs, they don't, they're not really accountable for their actions. And I'm not saying that they should be or they shouldn't be. They're just kind of stating I think that it, they're not really. Pro- yeah, it probably happens more behind, clo- you know, behind closed doors with the commission where it's you know it's kind of dealt with um and it's it's used as a, like within commissions as a, as a learning moment where they'll have these meetings and um look i know i know that um that uh danny core was submitting an application uh this week into sport or, or into the, the northern irish government for recognition uh within northern ireland so uh, maybe look if he can be successful with that um maybe that can be a, 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 the step forward that northern ireland at least needs to having some sort of commission um again i, I don't really i need to speak to to him uh or, or someone like danny about that um to figure out you know even if it did get recognized then what are the steps and you know who has the power like does a commission have the power so yeah but look work I don't, I don't i think i think these kind of things highlight that we don't really have uh any sort of um understanding <laughs> around how it's supposed to work or, or what the right way is and, and promotions just kind of do their own thing uh to a large extent so that's the crack there yeah no very well said very well said and yeah i mean what should or shouldn't happen you know we can say about it but it's not really going to make a difference. It's the powers that be that have to make those calls and make that happen. So hopefully it can happen sooner rather than later. Um, Next question is exact same question from Ross and and Andy Hickey as well. Uh, Does Nick, does air FC cage legacy and clad wars all on the same weekend dilute the cards as it's three in one weekend. And is it bad for Irish MMA? I wouldn't label it as bad for Irish MMA. I think the more cards we have on, the more chance for fighters to fight is a good thing but yeah it might dilute the cards a little bit or you could look at it as a way it might open up for other fighters to kind of maybe get a chance to go in and maybe make their debut or fight on a card that they might not have had room to fight on um do you guys have any thoughts about that does it uh, uh, three cards in the weekend not ideal for us because we'll have to have our head on a swivel that weekend to try cover all of those cards it's going to make it easy for us that week on the podcast it's not going to make us easy for us to travel i know you guys like to get on the road over in ireland and get out to events from that side of things from a media side of things and proper coverage it might make things awkward but more cards generally for me doesn't is not a bad thing really what do you guys think it's expensive for fans, to be honest. Um, do you know, if I wasn't, if we weren't covering media, I'd like to go to these things as a fan. I, I could consider going without, instead of going as media. But if I wanted to do two in a weekend, that's going to cost a feckin' arm and a leg, lads. Jeez, especially in Dublin. Um, so it's very expensive. Uh, and in terms of diluting the cards, I wouldn't be too worried about that. There's enough talent out there, but it's the... Yeah, it, it, it's not great in terms of... A, it's like they're competing against each other when maybe if you spaced them out a little bit, a bit better, but you look, maybe that's just how it fell. Yeah, it's probably... To be honest, it's probably uh, the, the least ideal for uh, cornermen or, you know, people in the actual gyms because if they've got... Or if coaches have multiple fighters fighting on different shows on the same night, then, you know, what are they supposed to do? What way do they fall on? Is it two on the same night? Uh, or is it it's a two Friday on the Sunday, Saturday? isn't it? It's, it's Friday era... And yeah. then I think it's both it's, a, it's Clan Wars and Cage Legacy right on the Sunday. On Sunday, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed, Crazy indeed. one, like Crazy, the Friday yeah. Sunday was a lovely. It was until because I think Clan Wars announced theirs last. Um, but look, anyway, I will, I will, I will not be making my way up to Belfast when there's a, a show in Dublin. I'll say that much. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Ross comes in with another one with the return of Max Lally. Who would you like to see him fight next? Bar his match up with Armand, which has been confirmed. Quilcha, anyone that's on the tip of your tongue that you'd like to see Max? I'd like to see Max fight anyone, really. Yeah, anyone to be honest. Yeah, um, it doesn't always have to be Irish fighter either. Um, so from the top of my head, I think I was looking through Team Renegade earlier and I saw Shay Ingram, who's also six and zero, similar to Max. Uh, so I'd love to see that. I'd love to see an international fight instead of just focusing so much on the Irish lads fighting each other. I think it'd be good. Indeed. What about someone like George Staines or somebody like that over there in the UK? He'd be a, that'd be a tasty one. Or both of those are lightweight, aren't they, Quilcha? Yeah, George fights at lightweight. He won the um, the Euros. He won the, the Euros, Euros yeah. yeah. 
undefeated yeah. still as well. Like absolute superstar. Be de- it'd be decent. Be decent. Uh, on I I mean I know they're not the same weight class, but maybe someone like Max versus Kiko or somebody like that would be decent enough to see on a, as a kind of a domestic fight. But they're not really the same weight class, so I don't know if that could happen really. Conor and McCarthy. He, Conor McCarthy. Yeah, there's loads of options for Max. It's great to see him back and it's great to see him recovered from his injury. Um, like, you know, we've talked time and time again about Max on this podcast and I'm looking forward to seeing him getting in there and competing again so we can kind of talk a little bit more about him. And, uh, you know, coming back, maybe we'll get the chance to talk to him about that comeback on the podcast. Um, moving on, uh, D. Begley asks... What's next for Brad Katona? I think we talked about Brad already. I think we'd all like to see him make that jump to the UFC. Uh, I think that's the right move for him. I think he has unfinished business there as well. So, um, yeah, I think it'd be great to see Brad in the UFC next. To Troy Gibson, um, shout out to Troy. I hope you're doing well, man. He yeah. asks his debut. Vadim, one year suspension enough? Or was it the worst officiating ever? Um, the one year suspension enough? My opinion is I wouldn't be too disappointed if I never seen Fadim fighting inside an Irish MMA cage again, to be honest. That would be my personal opinion. I mean, you're putting uh, you're putting the risk on another fighter asking him to go in there and fight in Fadim based off what we've seen so far. Um, worst officiating ever. Yeah, it's not. It's, yeah, it's one way it's to label bad. it. It's one way to label it. I mean, it was terrible. Like, I can't even get my head around it, but you know, try if you're listening. Speedy recovery to you, man. I hope you're safe. Hope you're well. Thanks for listening and sending in the question. Um, Ross Querney asks, "I'd love to hear what happened to the seventy-five thousand uh, prize money that was won at the Super Cup. Would you like to see it reinvested into the sport or given back to the athletes that won it?" Well. I'll send that to you, Quilsha. Um, or maybe I'll just say, giving it back to the athletes uh, directly is probably not the best move, but giving them back to them, you know, in regards to maybe better equipment, paying for their trips, uh, you know, I'm sure that money is going to be invested. We what? I we don't know what happened to it. Maybe we can have an IMF representative. I'm sure it's going to be going back into the sport some way. You're closer to the scene, I guess, Quilsha. Have you heard anything? No, no idea where it went, what's going on with it. Uh, Where's the money, Quilcha? Where's the money, Quilcha? It's all in the back pocket there, brown envelopes. It's all, all under the mattress. Uh, it's all under the mattress there, Quilcha. Uh, what's all, oh, lads? It slipped my mind. I was just about to say it. Um, it the, the money was just resting in my bank account. Is that the one? The <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, like, ah, jeez, I sure I don't know what's going on with it. Um, that's down to IMF. If they want to release what's happened with it, then sure, look. Fair play. We maybe I'd like to ask and maybe find out. Um, it's a fair bit of money given back to the athletes. Not too sure directly, as you were saying, Ian. Reinvest into sports. No, you want to see reinvest, right? Like build, build programs or, or or training facility. You know, whatever. Yeah. I'd like to see it go towards. You know how they're they have this thing with Tajikistan recently. I'd like to see some of it go towards that. I'd like to see some of it go towards national championships sending athletes to international championships i think that is probably the best route for it because it is quite a bit of money and i think it helped yeah. quite a lot in that sense but i don't know i'm not too sure of the intricacies of how they deal with their finances it's something that we we should probably ask a question on though ultimately i'd like to see less and less of the gofundme accounts that need to be set up mm. for fighters before they go and compete in these tournaments. It's hard enough to try and prepare yourself, let alone worrying about it financially as well. And I think if fighters in that situation should never have to fund their own trips, unfortunately, that's the situation we're in right now. So you have to adapt to it. But ultimately, you know, uh, it's great to see the support of these GoFundMes. But ultimately, it always is a little bit sad when I do see them up, knowing that the effort that goes in to try and raise funds to send these athletes out there to compete for their country. They're competing for their country mm. and they're having to pay their own way. And I just don't feel that that's right. And hopefully if the money could be used for that, it would be great. And, um, you know, hopefully that things change along those lines going forward as well. And uh, that kind of wraps us up really for episode 19. 19, guys, 19 episodes this year so far. We're loving it. We're loving it. Loving it. Thanks another, to everybody. Another long one. Another bumper another episode. episode. Probably set the record for the longest episode of the Outer Triangle in this one, but sure, yeah. once everyone is in, a lot of shit it, went down. 
yeah. like like Cypher Hill goes down and said, if the shit goes down, you better be ready. So we got ourselves ready. We talked talked it all out. We laid it all out there. Ultimately, we care about the fighters. We're we're expressing our opinions. We're calling it down the line, and we'll continue to do that. And um, you know that's what we're here for. Um, and hopefully, people enjoy it, respect it, and understand it. If you like what you hear, please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. Support Severe MMA on the YouTube channel. Head over to the Severe MMA Patreon account. Andy is over there doing podcasts. Quizja is there doing podcasts. I do podcasts on the on the Patreon as well. Uh, some great content over there. Um, Chasing Pack. All, all, of the, all of the Severe MMA team. Chasing Pack is there amongst other things as well. Um, Harry guess, Powell's one man booth Harry Powell's one man booth unreal content over there if you haven't been over there it's like five five euros five dollars for the month and I mean you're going to get some great uh, you're going to get some great content I really enjoyed uh, Shawnee and uh, Quilcha doing the Bama tour uh, or the Bama review with all those fights there no Andy you're going to be on Hot Topic over there this week as well which is probably out by the time this is this is out as well look at Support uh, support the website, support the Old Triangle, support Severe MMA. We're trying to do this the best we can independently. We're growing. We want to continue to grow, and we need your help and support to do that. Like the podcast, share the podcast, rate the podcast, and support the Patreon. Thanks once more to the lads for joining me today, as always, Andy and Quilsha. We'll be back in two weeks' time to break down all the cage warriors and all the other goings-on within, within Irish MMA. We will see you then. And for now, Quilcha, see us out there, friend. Slong a fall, Gachtina. <laughs>